Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, this final executive session of the uh, EAG conference. Thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully, some of you enjoyed the uh, conference evening last night. Uh, I'll just start off with the um, safety procedures. So, if there is a fire alarm, uh, and I believe it's a, a, sw a slow kind of whooping noise, uh, the exits are at the side of the room here, and then you go out the building at the side here, or you can go out uh, the back where you came in, and then out the sides of the building. Um, I don't think there's anything yes, else. That assembly point is uh, in front of uh, Hall 3. Assembly point in front of Hall 3. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're, we're going to run through a series of presentations. Uh, there's an app through which you can ask questions. Uh, there are some microphones at the side of the room as well if you want to, to stand up. But if you download the uh, EAG Paris 2017 app, uh, you can go to the program, choose this element from the executive program, uh, and then you can interact by clicking the button at the top right hand of the screen and you can ask questions. So we'll be uh, pulling in the questions that way or through the microphones uh, if you prefer that. So uh, the session is to cover uh, the topic of opening a new chapter in the North Sea uh, and asking the question, what does that mean? Uh, so uh, obviously the current oil price environment uh, and the maturity of the North Sea or perhaps the perceived maturity of the North Sea presents challenges to its future um, but it also creates opportunities in various areas. So we'll debate what's needed for the next chapter of the basin to be successful. A discussion will address key topics. Uh, they include uh, obviously exploration, safety, operational efficiency, collaboration, technology, commercial solutions, infrastructure and decommissioning. And the question we'll be asking is, what action is required by all the players in the basin to maximize the value of the economically recoverable hydrocarbons in the North Sea? So the, the agenda is as shown, so I'll give you a, an introductory talk um, and then we'll have a, a number of speakers and ask questions between each of the presentations. Uh, so we have uh, Isabel Bilat, so Isabel can you give us a wave please? A nod. Uh, so Isabel's VP of Exploration Europe for Total. We have Dave Lynch. So Dave is VP Reservoir Development North Sea from BP. We have Max Browers, VP Exploration Europe, Russia and Caspian for Shell. Trolls Albrechtsen, Chief Technology Officer for Maersk Oil. Gro Gunlaik Surud Hartvet, SVP Exploration Aka BP. And Nico Vala, VP Commercial Manager Europe Schlumberger. Uh, and I'm uh, Nick Richardson, Head of Exploration for the uh, Oil and Gas Authority in the United Kingdom. So I'm going to kick off uh, by giving you very much a, a regulatory perspective to uh, a new chapter in the North Sea. Um, now, you may or may not have read the Wood Report, uh, which is published on our website and uh, in a few other places as well, actually. It's, uh, it's quite an interesting perspective on um, what should be done to improve activity in the North Sea. It was written for a very, very different uh, price environment uh, and cost environment to the one that we're in, but uh, a number of the recommendations that fall out of the Wood Report are actually highly appropriate to the situation we're in now. So lots of the actions are uh, absolutely identical to the ones that will be recommended if you rewrote the report. Uh, and from a regulatory perspective, uh, I mean, we think it's... Uh, good to provide a, a stable, predictable regime uh, in which to operate, uh, but that doesn't mean we should stand still and be static. Uh, so we have an attitude of uh, continuous improvement and working with industry to make sure that we tackle any barriers uh, and uh, get the right actions in place across uh, certainly the UK part of the basin. Uh, but we also work very closely with other regulators across the North Sea uh, to make sure that uh, we, we do things in tandem with each other. So what's the role of the Oil and Gas Authority? Um, essentially, we have what's called a central obligation, which means that uh, relevant persons, and that means essentially license holders uh, and some others uh, who own, own infrastructure in particular, must take the steps necessary to secure the maximum value of economically recoverable petroleum is recovered from the strata beneath UK waters. Uh, and uh, many of the other regulators across the North Sea have a, a, a similar aim. So we, we operate not just in the regulatory space, as you can see here, but uh, we also operate within the influencing space. Uh, and there's obviously been lots of discussion in this conference about collaboration and how to encourage it. Uh, 
but also in the promotional space. So making sure that we get new investment into the basin uh, and not just new investment, but uh, investment that can take assets from other hands and uh, do something of value with them. So <clears throat> we have a, a published approach called the MER UK strategy. Uh, and that has a number of binding obligations on industry. So there are things that we expect industry to do, and uh, <coughs> legally they must carry these things out. <coughs> but we also have uh, safeguards for industry as well, so we can't force industry to, to carry out certain actions that are detrimental to their business, essentially. What's new for the OGA since we were created a couple of years ago is uh, we have increased sanctions powers, uh, and we can put improvement notices onto companies as well. So if we see that the behaviors are inappropriate or the actions that are being taken are inappropriate, we can make sure the, uh, the right steps are taken to resolve that. Uh, and then we can also step into disputes um, and resolve those uh, through a number of different channels. A thing that has been somewhat controversial, I think, for some operators is that we're also able to attend meetings. So similar to what happens in Norway, uh, we now have the power in the UK to come into joint venture meetings. Uh, and I think you'd be surprised at what a difference that makes in terms of the behaviors. Uh, so it's not just about actions, but how companies work together with each other. Uh, and just having the regulator present can make a massive difference. <coughs> and beyond that, there's also information and samples powers. So Many, many times I get asked about data availability in the United Kingdom. I think it is a, a fundamental thing that underpins all the actions. Uh, so we're trying to get more data available to industry uh, and data available on a, an open basis as well so that uh, it can be used uh, as freely as possible. And then particularly in the area of exploration, we've uh, listened to industry, had, uh, had a dialogue about how we can improve the licensing system. Uh, so we have more flexible licenses. Uh, which basically allow you to design a work program uh, and then choose the appropriate duration of your license. Uh, and also supporting that is uh, changes to the fiscal regime. So we've improved these quite substantially. <coughs> and if you look at the UK on a full cycle basis, uh, it's much more attractive than, uh, than other regimes around the North Sea. So all, all of these actions will help to, to support us in various areas of action, uh, one of which will be uh, the licensing round, which will be opening soon. So the 30th license round will cover uh, mature parts of the basin where there's infrastructure. Um, it will run for 120 days, and it will be open fairly soon, and that will be a real first test of a lot of the, uh, the things that we've put into place. And then you may have heard of uh, the seismic programs that we've also uh, had ongoing over the last two years. Uh, so one of them has been associated with the 29th round. It was very successful at uh, attracting new players into the basin, but also bringing in some old players who'd been absent for a while, uh, and also expanding the footprint of uh, existing players in the, in the North Sea. So it has had a real tangible effect. Uh, so we'll have some more seismic data, which will be available at the end of the year to, uh, to also encourage companies to look again at some of those frontier areas that have not been touched for uh, two or three decades even. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> we spend a lot of time listening to industry about the barriers to investment in the UK. Um, and on this slide, you can see uh, on the top of the slide above ground measures that we put into place uh, and then some below ground measures that we <coughs> have put into place and are continuing to put into place. So getting the, uh, the assets in the North Sea into the right hands is critical. Making sure that companies have access to infrastructure. And... Uh, I think there's, uh, there's some misconceptions that have arisen over the years about access to infrastructure in the UK. Uh, and I can say that over the last two years, we have not had any issues of an operator not being able to secure access for a, a tie back into an existing facility. So we have been able to resolve all of those, uh, those issues. <coughs> And we're, we're underpinned by various powers, including uh, those laid out in uh, what's called the Infrastructure Code of Practice. There's various cost reduction uh, initiatives that have been ongoing, some of which have been run by us, some of which have been run by, uh, by industry. Um, and so a lot of those are centered around standardization, simplification, um, but also critical is contracting strategies. And I think you'll hear from uh, some of the members of the panel on how contracting strategies and looking at those uh, can increase the levels of activity. 
Uh, and then of particular importance is uh, lack of capital, often cited as the reason for uh, not exploring as much as we could do. Uh, so we've been working quite closely with the finance community to understand uh, new models available. And you would have seen through the press uh, a number of the new companies that have been uh, taking assets from some of the, the established players uh, are backed by private equity. Uh, and that will be an interesting story to, to follow over the next years of, uh, of how that evolves. Um, but I don't think we should assume that uh, they're not into uh, certain areas of activity. Some of those private equity players are actually willing to explore within the basin as well as uh, take those production assets. Uh, <coughs> misalignment within joint ventures, uh, as I mentioned earlier, being present in, the, in meetings has a big effect, uh, but then also facilitating some of those meetings, uh, having standardized agreements and processes really, really helps. Uh, divestment packages, uh, often divestments are done on a piecemeal basis, but we, uh, we can get an overview and then try and tie those things together so that there's a, an area strategy that underpins all of the actions uh, and all of the, uh, <coughs> the assets that can change hands. Uh, licensing regime, as I've mentioned, uh, is important, so more flexibility in licensing. Uh, we have lower entry levels. Uh, so we've reduced uh, rental fees, uh, we've reduced the levy, uh, particularly for small businesses. Uh, so you can come in as a, as a very small player. Um, with, uh, if you've got 10 people or less in your business, <coughs> you can essentially come in and pay a low levy. And then the idea is do the technical work that uh, then some of the, the more established, larger players can then, uh, then pick up and run with. Uh, and improvements to the fiscal regime. Uh, and critical to this is also the treatment of late, light light, late life assets. Uh, so this has an impact on exploration. So if you think all the way through to the decommissioning phase, how are you going to cope with those decommissioning liabilities? Uh, and uh, if you want to continue exploration, how does that work together? <coughs> and then <coughs> uh, below ground measures. Uh, so there's lots of technical things that we can do as well. Application of geophysical technologies, so not just going and acquiring new seismic data, but uh, what are the, the new technologies that really need to be applied in the basin. Data availability and access. Uh, so you see on here it says OGL, that's the Open Government License. We try to publish our data under open government terms, which basically means companies can pick that data up uh, and they can even commercialize it for themselves uh, so that they can establish new businesses and we have seen that from uh, from the data that we've published in the last year uh, the third topic on there is machine learning uh, I would guess that that's probably the most mentioned thing at this conference so far is machine learning um, very very topical issue uh, and I'm sure we're going to debate the uh, the pros and cons of it a little bit later uh, and then quantum computing and how that might come in so where we have quantum computers under our desks what difference will that make what's the role of the geoscientist in all of this uh, well cost reduction initiatives uh, I've mentioned uh, and then there's portfolio discipline uh, so one of the things that we see across countries within the North Sea is uh, certainly in the exploration domain is uh, over prediction of the volumes that will be found. Uh, there's also an underestimation of, uh, of risk in a sense. So p companies think things are more risky than they actually are and perhaps there's a business opportunity to be had there in exploring for smaller targets that could then be tied together. So clustering is, uh, is really, really topical. Uh, <coughs> Post-well analysis, so we get involved uh, pre-drill and post-drill. We try to get involved at the investment stage so that we can make sure the right decisions are being taken. Uh, and then the last two points on there, skills retention and development, absolutely critical in terms of the, uh, the crew change that is taking place. Uh, and also working with uh, low carbon industries. And uh, there are some great examples of this uh, in the Southern North Sea where uh, some of the wind farms have basically offered their infrastructure for electricity transportation to uh, <coughs> companies that may produce gas, use turbines offshore to generate electricity, and then send it back to shore through the, uh, the electricity uh, network when the wind turbines are not uh, working at full capacity. Uh, and then beyond that, there's also uh, carbon capture and storage and how that might play into the future picture. But all of these um, actions, they're, they're underpinned by improved collaboration. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the UK is that uh, collaboration is a legal obligation. You must collaborate if you're operating in the UK. Um, so we have uh, some methods by which companies can uh, analyze 
how well they collaborate, and that's a very interesting exercise to go through. So uh, there are some companies that think they're absolutely fantastic at collaborating, <coughs> and then when you ask their joint venture partners and their contractors and various others, actually it turns out there are a number of areas where they could improve the way that they collaborate and the way that they behave with each other. So there's, there's no surprise there, I think, to, to all of you. So what's, what's the picture for, for the entire basin? Um, and I think this, this applies you know, across the North Sea. It's not just a UK thing. We, we need to really work together on different areas of activity. Um, so exploration can't be carried out uh, in the absence of knowledge of uh, what's the forward schedule for decommissioning, when are various bits of infrastructure going to come offline. Uh, and then we need to be efficient in that decommissioning activity as well, so tie various, uh, various pieces of uh, dismantling together. Um, so, although on an exploration front we can help by, uh, by halving well costs, we can also help by uh, extending the life of fields. Uh, we can work to improve efficiencies, so there's various things we can do in the area of logistics. We can consolidate infrastructure. Uh, we're challenging companies to use their facilities, uh, use the assets that they have or lose them, uh, which can mean we either pass them on to someone else or we take them away for relicensing. Uh, we want decommissioning to be uh, efficient. We encourage companies to come together uh, and work particularly on things like abandonment programs, but then into the future, larger scale decommissioning activity, uh, and that will result in substantial cost savings. And then there's the area of, uh, of digital. Uh, so how, how can we bring data into the picture and use it effectively? How can we simplify what we do uh, and waste uh, less of our time on just messing about with data and spend more of our time actually thinking about it. Uh, and then jobs and skills, fundamental to, to underpin the future. Uh, so we have uh, three, four decades of production left uh, in the North Sea alone. Um, so uh, if you factor in uh, the Atlantic margin, Barents Sea and other areas, uh, the, the life of the Northwest Europe region will be uh, recontinued. Uh, and then technology, how does that underpin everything? I think we're going to have some, uh, some good discussions later on uh, various areas of technology where that can help. Uh, but then also, how can we build in areas that can be exported around the world uh, and, uh, I guess, build capability that uh, goes beyond the oil and gas uh, sector itself, but uh, potentially into other sectors as well. So uh, <coughs> we're here as a regulator to, uh, to underpin that activity, to make sure it's profitable for industry uh, and make sure it's sustained uh, through the life cycle. So that's, uh, that's the end of my, uh, my introduction. I'm now going to invite the, uh, the first speaker up, uh, which will be followed by some questions before we go into the, the subsequent speakers. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Isabel Bilat uh, to come up to the front uh, and give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for the early birds who made it uh, this morning after uh, the big party yesterday uh, at EIG. Uh, opening a new chapter in the North Sea, what does it mean? Um, I think it's a very, very interesting question, and uh, it's really at the heart of, uh, uh, I think, uh, majors at our... Uh, questioning ourselves, but also uh, all the panel here, I'm sure, uh, will bring a lot of uh, insightful perspective. Certainly at Total, this is really a, a question we are tackling. Um, we've been present in the North Sea at large, uh, in Norway, in the UK, of course, uh, in the Netherlands. Historically, uh, I think we can say it's, it's been a heartland for us. and. Um, opening a new chapter, adapting, uh, he, we see it, it crucial and, and we, we, we are conducting actions to, to open this new, new chapter. So first, um, I think I personally believe in the, in the basin and if we go back to geology, uh, opening a new chapter, um, 
Is it more exploration or uh, are we already on a decline? It could be a first question that I think we we'll probably have also some discussions. We believe, I am geologist in background, I believe in the potential of the basin and uh, uh, we think uh, that uh, today we, we need to push uh, a little bit more and, uh, and have new ideas and new place so that the, the, the geological story of the basin is not over. So this is a, a first answer. Um, so opening a new chapter, uh, is it uh, some more of the same or is it something completely new? In fact, it's probably a fine line between the two. Um, there are some uh, um, uh, important things that we have to continue to do. And uh, HSE is the first one uh, that uh, we need to, uh, to, to continue to do. Uh, we need to lead in the North Sea as an industry and uh, with a regulator. We need to lead uh, with the highest uh, uh, global HSE standards. And it's crucial. We, we, we are tackling very complex uh, 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 industry and uh, complex challenges, complex wells, uh, complex environment, some HPHP wells, and uh, uh, being there for decades in the North Sea doesn't mean it is easy operations, and each operation has their own challenge. And uh, with uh, targeting uh, some targets below uh, depleted fields uh, or managing uh, very uh, uh, very long uh, depletion in fields bring their own challenge and we need to, to keep that in mind in everything that we do. So this is really something uh, the industry shall, shall put on the top of the list uh, and, and keep in mind. We, we are conducting a, a, a shift, I would say, um, in the way we approach the basin, it seems obvious, but clearly this basin is one basin. And across the borders, uh, we should uh, make sure we, we approach it as one basin. Um, we, we have seen uh, in, in total, especially, and probably it's a, a large corporate issue sometimes. I mean, we have teams to manage that can work isolated. So. We, we are really working uh, to put uh, things together uh, to make sure that the knowledge we have across the border and the learnings we have are shared by all teams and can be used uh, to uh, generate, facilitate new ideas. So this is really, really uh, something important in our view to go back to the geology uh, and make sure that uh, uh, the, the cross-border uh, uh, thinking can, can be leveraged. Um, I told you we, we believe in the potential of the basin. So in this very challenging period that we are going through in worldwide for the oil industry, but uh, especially also in the North Sea, we believe we need to be resilient. Uh, of course, we have to be selective in our targets, but we believe we have to be resilient in conducting exploration and that more can be done. Uh, of course, there have been a uh, few uh, very large and emblematic discoveries in, in the North Sea, and Sergio being one, but there are also other successes uh, by the industry. They are less than there was in the past. This is clear, but still the basin is delivering, so we, we need to, to make it through. The shift we are conducting is uh, on the focus uh, to value creation that probably uh, in total and in the industry uh, we, we lost track a little bit uh, in some crazy years uh, where we've, we've been competing, competing for acreage capture and where we have committed to a lot of work to access this uh, acreage and where probably we've been not so selective in what we did or took probably a little bit more risk. Uh, taking risks is good, but there is a fine line to, to make. And um, today, we, this value creation is, is something we have to work on. And this will be, a, a, I'm, I'm convinced, this will be a, a combined work uh, that we will do 
uh, between all the, the participants of this uh, industry, of course the regulator, uh, the companies, the contractors in the way we work and how we approach things that become more and more complex. Last, and I think it was uh, already raised this morning, and we see this as critical as well, we are ending complex um, operations. We are uh, facing complex geology. Uh, the easy four-way uh, traps are behind us, or most of them. Um, our future success will be our ability to, to find new traps that are more difficult to image or that uh, need to bring in uh, new, new concepts in geology. And, and this, uh, we believe, uh, can be accelerated through some collaboration and partnerships that we did not envisage in the past. So uh, we, we, we believe uh, making it through these uh, difficult times will be uh, through collaborative work and, and finding a, a balance between collaboration and, and uh, LC competition. We have some uh, uh, challenges uh, to tackle clearly. Uh, the, if we look back for the last 10 years, clearly, f apart from very few projects in the North Sea, the industry uh, has failed uh, to, to convert technical discovery to commercial discovery. And, and this is something we, we need to work on. Um, the, the challenge on selectivity, so um, for Total, and I believe it's the same for most uh, companies, um, a question we have to address is an, um, how, how can we compete in our proposal in the North Sea at the global level for budget? So, this is uh, a ranking exercise we do. Each proposal we make, we rank it at the global level. And we need to find solutions so that uh, our proposal in exploration are, are making it through in a restricted budget environment, in a, a depressed uh, oil and gas price that uh, have uh, hit us, uh, again, especially in the North Sea area. So we, we, are, we have to work our geology, we have to work uh, our prospects, uh, deliver new plays, um, but we also have to tackle our, our costs. And th this, uh, this lower cost exploration, um, we are starting to, to, to tackle. I think we, we are uh, working with the contractors to, to find new ways of doing things. And uh, it's probably the start of a, of a story uh, uh, that uh, we hope will, uh, will be beneficial uh, to, to unlock uh, these projects. So we have a focus on this uh, value creation, capital discipline and cost, and we believe it's, it's really critical to conduct this work in parallel of uh, rejuvenating ourselves and proposing uh, uh, new ideas and new plays. Last, I think the, the last uh, aspect of our future, uh, we believe, is partnership and collaboration. Uh, the authorities, uh, the regulator has a b big impact and, and we've just seen that uh, it's part of their roadmap. But I think we don't have to wait for them and uh, this is something we can manage ourselves. Standardization is probably something we need to accelerate um, and, and again in, in the frame of uh, being collaborative, tackling challenge and also uh, cost reduction. We believe it's something that shall be accelerated. And finally, we see new uh, business model emerging uh, around us and it's good, good test. Um, and uh, I hope it will bring some agility to the industry and I hope it will uh, uh, help us to transform. Uh, this is really what, what we are uh, trying to do. So um, I will end my, my uh, presentation there, but I think my last word would be that uh, a new chapter in the North Sea for us is it will be 
uh, finding a fine line between doing more of what we've been doing in the past on HSE, on sound geology, but uh, our ability to adapt quickly, uh, to be more collaborative, to find new solutions, uh, to approach complex, uh, uh, complex problems together in a collaborative way and, uh, and unlock, uh, I am sure, uh, the future uh, prospects and discoveries uh, that are waiting for us. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. <clears throat> uh, have we got any questions from the floor that anybody would like to ask? If you, if you would, you can either use the microphones at the side of the room, uh, or again, you can use the app, and uh, I can see your questions on this screen here, so you can do it anonymously as well if you, uh, if you don't want it to be known what you're asking. So, um, we, we have got a question here. It's, um, what, what do you think the role of, uh, of regulators is uh, in opening a chapter in the North Sea? So uh, what's, what's the right balance in terms of, I guess, regulatory involvement and uh, leaving companies to, to do what they want. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. My mic, okay, thank you. Yeah, as I think you, you touched on it uh, this morning and we, we believe uh, that uh, the, the regulatory uh, have a role to play to, to facilitate, to, to move us away from uh, competition at all price I would say, to collaboration. Uh, this is a shift we have seen. There is um, an opening already on uh, uh, more data sharing, more flexibility uh, uh, on working together. Uh, we think there is probably uh, more that can be done. Uh, there is uh, probably some discussions uh, uh, on the infrastructures uh, access to facilitate uh, infrastructure access, uh, obviously on, on the uh, fiscal terms in case of uh, a continuous depressed environment, but uh, uh, we believe the co collaboration between the companies mm -hmm. are essential. <coughs> there are a lot of forums that have been launched uh, through the impulsion of uh, regulators in both in uh, UK and Norway and forums where uh, uh, some of our panels, uh, major, uh, mid-cap companies, contractors can have the opportunity to work together with the regulators and, and we see this really as uh, very positive and uh, helping us to, mm -hmm. to, emerge, to make emerging uh, solutions. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I follow you very much. And, uh, in Norway, when, when they changed the fiscal terms in 2003-04, I believe, it's, uh, it really increased the exploration activity. So we see that it, it can make a change uh, and, and become a game changer. Uh, but it's also about, as you said, sharing data. And, and I believe that uh, we, that's also how we think and, uh, and, and work in Norway, because it's, uh, the competition goes on how we use the data. And so discussing also with other in when we are forming this uh, area of mutual interest before we, we apply, I think that's also a very good um, uh, time for discussing different kind of ideas and so on. So you get so many ideas up and, and, and that also create, um, create both uh, energy and, and new opportunities. Uh, so I think there are, uh, there are many issues around the regulatory. Um, regulatory, which uh, could also help us to, to drive this business further. Mm -hmm. You got any other perspectives? I think, there, I mean, to me, there's two roles. There's one is holding the, holding the license holders to account for their performance, mm -hmm. and, and, and I can um, say that with an, a bit of nervousness because <laughs> <laughs> I might I might feel it, I might feel your uh, finger on my collar sometime. But there's absolutely absolutely that, and you know, we've moved a bit late to the game in terms of setting up the OGA with the. The skills that it's got in the UK, but it's uh, it's helped, and I know the NPD has been particularly effective in Norway for a for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing I think that the the regulators can do is be a trusted voice back into the government. So so your influence with with Treasury and making sure we've got the right fiscal terms in place, fiscal terms appropriate for the life of field or <coughs> life of the basin, uh, and, and also in other parts of government as well, where you're maybe able to help. Um, help the supply chain and working to keep, that, to keep the domestic supply chain strong. 
by by promoting export opportunities, mm -hmm. but but have the have the uh, have the company still based within the UK because once we start to lose the supply chain, we'll, we'll suffer a lot. So uh, so I think there's those two things of holding the the various companies to account for the performance, and the second thing is being a really trusted advisor for the government because I don't think they've had that. They're very suspicious of the companies when we go and ask them for things. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe just one, one additional point to everything which you already <coughs> said on this. Uh, but I guess in particular for where the North Sea at this, is at this moment in time, uh, in order to open that next chapter, we really need innovation. And I think maybe the governments or the regulators could do a little bit more even in that area to stimulate innovation, mm -hmm. if you like, risk-taking in a positive kind of sense next to the existing transparent, stable fiscal system, etc. That is an additional area mm -hmm. where maybe we can do a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing on that point is that uh, in the UK we now have the Oil and Gas Technology Centre. Um, so if you if you go to the United Kingdom stand, you'll see that there's a there's a poster up there outlining which areas they get involved in. So although it's not our uh, role necessarily to get too involved in uh, in the technology and the innovation, there is support from government and uh, there is some some match funding that is available to industry to try and stimulate uh, activity in areas that could take us beyond uh, the, the areas of activity we're in at the moment. <coughs> okay. Any other questions from the floor or anything from the panel on that issue? No? Okay, so uh, I think we'll move to the next presentation now. So uh, Dave Lynch will now talk to you. So I think Dave's very much going to talk about resource progression within the, the North Sea. That's right, yeah. Uh, morning, everybody. That's a bit better. <laughs> You're also sleepy from uh, the beers from last night. Um, yeah, as Nick said, I'm going I'm to focus on um, on the imperative for for up in the game and resource progression in, in the in the North Sea, but particularly the UKCS. So I'll talk to the UKCS. So apologies uh, for the other countries that that make up the North Sea. Um, the, the the industry has been tremendously focused on two things uh, recently. One is production efficiency. And, and we've been woeful in, in terms of, uh, of the uptime of our assets across the whole of the basin, about 60% a couple of years ago. Another thing we've been focusing on is cost efficiency, which has also been an imperative, and, and we've made great progress on that. The area that doesn't get attention in a really holistic sense is what we're doing around resource progression. So I've got one slide uh, which, we'll, um, which we'll move to um, eventually. What do I do? Oh, end. Right, okay. And then me. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, I've got one slide that will co we'll cover the, the the numbers for the basin. Um, just before we do, so we'll just say something about BP. This is this picture here is uh, from our, our, our West of Shetland asset. So for for BP currently, we are really opening a new chapter, or certainly a different chapter for us in the North Sea. This this project here came online um, last month. Uh, it's just in the build-up build up at the moment. It's a redevelopment of the Shehalian field. What we'll do, we'll double recovery from Shehalian. Um, we've got a second project coming on called Clear Ridge. It'll come on um, in uh, the start of 20, 2018. And then we're working with Maersk, and I think uh, we're going to hear a little bit about the Killeen field as well, which for us is gonna, comes on in 19. So we've got three big projects coming online, one after the other. That, coupled with the, the advance or the, the uh, improvements we're making in our base assets, means that we're on track to double our production in the basin from 2014 through to 2019. So that, that's quite a different story to how the basin's performing at the moment, which has effectively been in decline since 2000. The other thing we're doing is, uh, is taking a look at what's the exploration portfolio of the North Sea looking like for us. And this year, in 2017, BP is involved in six exploration wells in the basin. And that's attracting 25% of our entire global exploration capex. So we see we see there is a real future for us here. We've got a strong production build coming through. And then we're looking to see how we can replace that production in the post-2020 period through some kind of front-end activities around exploration. So it, it does feel like there's a new chapter for us. It's a different chapter. It's not the chapters we experienced before. Clearly, there's a lot less production in the basin now. Uh, it's more complex. But it, it, does feel, uh, it does feel quite different for us. Um, so we'll just, just uh, we'll take a look at the numbers um, so this is my single slide that I've got, no other, no other content. And it, um, 
And so really, we are looking at the resource base of the, of the entire basin. So we'll, we'll kind of uh, we'll walk through the numbers. There's an oft-quoted oft number, certainly when the Scottish independent debate was taking place, that there's 20-plus billion barrels, and you know, it's all going to be great, vote, vote for the Scottish independent party. Um, well, it's a bit more complicated than that, of course. So just, just using this, this uh, picture here, um, this, uh, this thing here. So the basin's produced about 43.5 billion barrels to date. It's got 6 billion barrels in what we call sanctioned resources. So that's barrels that are connected to the well bores that we're producing from at the moment, or they're barrels that are subject to being already being part of an FID, a final investment decision. So they're projects like the one we just showed you just now, like Clare Ridge, like the Killeen Field that you'll hear about. So 6 billion barrels, kind of, you don't have to do anything except just execute your projects, and you'll, be, you'll, be, uh, you'll get those. There's a category up here, technical resource, and of course there's a range around these things, right? So these are the OGA's um, preliminary view of what the basin looks like. So there's about 5 billion barrels in discovered volumes. Okay, so we've drilled, we've got either stranded pools, or we've got additional recovery within our fields that could sum up to about 5 billion barrels. And then I kind of guess the most uh, uncertain number is right at the top here, which is, the, well, what's the yet to find potential of the basin? And clearly there's a wide range around that. But the kind of unaccepted estimate, sort of central estimate, is around about 6 billion barrels. So you can add that lot up, 6 and 6 and 5 gives you 15. There's your kind of central case between that further 10 to 20 billion barrels still to come from the basin. You think that sounds pretty good. But the thing to pay attention to is the way we are moving barrels between these different categories. So the other numbers that's relevant here is this one here, for example, this one, 0.6 billion barrels, which was the basin's production in 2016. The really important number to look at there is doing the ratio of the, 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 the um, resource base here and this number here, so the so-called reserve to production ratio, which is 10 years. That's not a big RTP, and uh, you know, if you look at VP Statistical Review of Energy, you'll see that the, the UK sector has got one of the lowest RTPs in the world. What's feeding that? Well, um, part of it is the fact that we're not progressing many barrels from this category down into this category as we develop ideas, think about things, and make investments. And in 2016, we only converted 100 million barrels, 0.1 billion barrels, from this category to this category. So we only replaced a sixth of what we actually produced. That's not enough to kind of sustain production over the longer term and make a difference to the RTP. And then on the exploration side of things, uh, probably last year was a more successful year than we've had recently, and we found 200 million barrels from the exploration drill bit. But again, relative to the production number of 0.6, we're only finding a third of what we're producing. And of course, not all of that third is going to drop through that, that, um, these set of buckets. So there is, there's absolutely a requirement for intervention in the basin. It, it's needed. Otherwise, we will be going out of business. We'll be facing a very different chapter, which relates to decommissioning, rather than continue to create value through, uh, through production. Now, from BP's perspective, you know, the North Sea absolutely is an attractive place to, to, uh, to invest. We've got um, you know, fantastic history, 50 years of operating experience in the North Sea, so we know how to do it as a company and as a base, and we know how to do it. We've got you know, an absolutely world-class supply chain. So we've got huge capability in the supply chain to be able to support future activities. We've got a very strong incumbent infrastructure position that's been developed over the 50 years we've operated here. Um, and generally speaking, uh, we've, got a, we've got a stable political environment to operate in. Um, you, you might think it's a bit of a laugh if you're from the UK and you've been watching the voting recently, but um, generally speaking, stable and a pretty attractive fiscal regime as well. The, the tax take, um, you know, uh, a few years ago, kind of with some of the older fields was 81%, other fields was 62%, now we're down to kind of 40% tax rate. Big difference, it makes things pretty competitive within BP's portfolio. So it's an attractive place to invest. There is resource potential here, this is real. You can debate the numbers, is it 10, is it 20, it doesn't matter, there's still a prize to go there, for there, and it's across a spectrum of, of, of buckets, it's across do more within the recovery factor, it's small pools that have been discovered but not developed, and of course the exploration potential as well. But it's not easy. The price environment for us is still tough. We've taken operating costs down by half in the last couple of years, 
Similarly with development costs, down by half as well. But it's still, it's still tough to get it, to get things across the line. Um, things are becoming more complex. It's just nature of, the, nature of the maturity of the basin, a bit more complicated. And the real issue just now, I think Nick touched on this a little bit, is what I call the notion of resource evaporation. Some of these numbers will disappear because we end up decommissioning projects early. It r removes those barrels as being potentially pro uh, producible. Now, there are enablers, and in, in, kind of in, in my head, there, there's probably three. So I'll, I'll talk at a high level to them, and maybe through the discussions we can get into a bit more detail. But the first is, it's absolutely imperative we, we ramp up the pace of exploration and exploration success. Now, slightly contentiously, you know, I, I kind of not really a big supporter of going out to the frontier areas to shoot, shoot the seismic the government shot. I would have said we should be focusing the seismic Within the, with around the infrastructure, particularly the critical piece of infrastructure that are central to a lot of production in the catchment area of that infrastructure. We need to make sure as, a, as an industry that these things are held whole and they survive because a lot of barrels are dependent on them. So you know, my, in my head, Lynch's head, is the focus on exploration needs to be around near-field exploration to try and keep those pieces of infrastructure going. If you think uh, the RTP is 10 years and some of the frontier barrels probably aren't going to appear, appear until 10 to 15 years' time, that's an awful long time to expect the supply chain and infrastructure to hang on. The second enabler is really, really focusing on recovery factor in the discovered barrels that we've got. Um, the average recovery factor of the oil fields is certainly less than 50%. There's more to be done, and it's across multiple um, buckets. If we can do something at the poor scale and mobilize maximum oil at the poor scale, if we can find through really good uh, you know, 4D seismic, monitoring, surveillance, good geology, good engineering, we can find a way to sweep that mobilized oil towards our producers really efficiently. And if we have lots and lots of producers, because we've cracked low-cost drilling, laterals, all sorts of novel things, we could put more drainage points into our reservoirs. And then finally, if our facilities could last forever because they stay integral and the costs are low, you take those four things, poor scale sweep, drainage points, and time, and we'll have high recovery factors. And as an industry, we need to be collectively after that. Recovery factor is not a subsurface thing. It's absolutely a facilities thing. It's absolutely a cost thing. And the third point, kind of in terms of the key enablers, is, is something Nick touched on earlier there, which is about um, making sure the assets are in the right hands. So there comes a point you know, for a company like BP that we don't think the barrels that are left in a field are competitive in our global portfolio. And that'll be true of many other companies. What's really important is we get out of that asset at the right time. We don't suck it dry and then try and offload it at a late, you know, late, too late a time when there's no, juice left in the, there's no juice left in the field. It's really important to get those, you know, transfer it when NPV is still seen to be higher than NPC. And I think the regulators got a strong position to see, play in that, where, they're, where they don't see companies taking that on. They need to intervene and, uh, and help. So, it, it, you know, you could say it's quite bleak when you look at our uh, conversion ratios. I would say it's positive when you think about the, ba the fact that the barrels are there and it needs, a, a, you know, a real intervention to make a difference in this space. And if we did that, we will have a new chapter, albeit a different chapter. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, so uh, we have a question here. Um, so given that we've got a long history of uh, activity in the basin, so 50 plus years of activity, um, and we're at a relatively mature stage. If you look at the life cycle of the North Sea, how would you do things differently? So if you are looking to a new basin, new countries, what advice would you give them? Is it to me? To you first, Dave, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think one of the things I've, I've experienced with the OGA is, um, is uh, quite a lot of helpful support uh, and, and, and kind of difficult inquiry as well. So if I was a, if it was a new country opening up, one of the things I would definitely do is get a strong, capable, well-resourced regulator in at the start and, and have them work closely with, uh, with industry. The other thing I think that's caused us, you know, some blips in terms of kind of uh, investment performance is, uh, 
it's going to change his tax regime. So again, you know, a regulator could really help be that trusted mm -hmm. advisor to advise um, uh, the tax authorities on kind of how they be treating the industry. And they really need to have a, a life of field solution for, mm -hmm. uh, for tax and not just do this kind of um, you know, boom and bust kind of approach that, the, that kind of be, we have been in uh, historically. So a couple of things there. I think one is, one is uh, you know, strengthen that regulator from, from day one. Um, the second thing is, is, you know, take a look at the kind of taxation side of things, make sure mm -hmm. you've got a fiscal strategy for the basin. Um, somewhat controversially, from, from a BP perspective, I would probably you know, question whether you really want to have critical pieces of infrastructure being held by the offshore operators. There might be a way to do things differently. We're starting mm -hmm. to see that just now with the offshore, the key offshore infrastructure and terminals are going to kind of midstream companies now. That feels like it's a good thing to do. Hmm. Uh, so there's probably three things. Okay. Has so anyone else got any views on, I guess, uh, advice you will give? You should give to others uh, that are, I guess, in the regulatory space, how they can help industry. I think, I think from from my perspective, you're touching on the the, the life of field, and I think taking everything that we've learned from the many basins that we've <coughs> explored and exploited and make sure that we've from the start at the onset understand how we need to de-risk the the basin and how we created a fully f planned f f from start to end having the end in mind and making sure that that allows us to and with the regulator supporting that to do phased investment so that we continuously are efficient in the way of but pursuing the goal in mind, maximum economic recovery from mm -hmm. that base. And I think that would be the single most important thing for us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll say one thing from an oil and gas authority perspective is I think it really helps having a, a regulator that is independent from government uh, and that can make its decisions and recommendations, uh, you know, without that overprint of, uh, of politics on top of it. So uh, that's, that's certainly a a good thing in terms of stability and predictability. Um, just want to go back to one of your numbers on your, uh, your slide there, Dave. So that, that yet to find number, obviously when you start in a basin that's an imperfect number, uh, it's still an imperfect number. How important is it for a government to give you a number like that or should we just let industry do its own sums basically and do its own exploration and regional work? You want me to deal with that one? Um, We'll have our own view and our own acreage. Um, having a picture like this, though, that you can stand behind firmly is kind of is sends a positive message out to the to the globe to potential investors. So you know we we kind of self fund effectively, uh, and big companies will. The smaller companies will be looking for what's the posi they're looking for positive messages around the entire basin. So when they go out to seek funding, they want they want to feel part of a positive story, not mm -hmm. one of a dwindling difficult story. So. You know, having a really clear articulation of this and the re potential that's out there is, I think, is good for future investors. Yeah, yeah. Girl. Yeah, I, I believe I come from the same uh, same place as uh, as uh, you from uh, yeah. Dave. Dave, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, because uh, it, you know, and also for uh, for a smaller company, you know, to to, to get the figures and, and the kind of their direction by, by the regulator. I think that's important because otherwise you need to use so much resources uh, just to understand the full potential uh, in, in the basin. So, so get the kind of frame to, and try to check it out and, and discuss and, and see what kind of, of funding you have to put into this. It's, it's important, I believe, that uh, the regulator comes up mm -hmm. with, uh, yeah. with those numbers. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, on a whole, I see fewer, I guess, regional analyses from companies. But it's interesting, Isabel, that you uh, you mentioned the, the the one basin approach. So there are companies that are coming back and saying, well, hang on, maybe if we take another look, and again, if we remove the borders and remove some of those barriers, and maybe look a little bit more openly at the acreage that's on offer, that will offer us some potential. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about this uh, this one basin philosophy, and I guess why now at uh, such a perceived late stage in the, in the basin? And in fact, um, well, in fact, we are trying to go back to basics. I think what we have seen uh, is that we had a tendency to work around our assets and core areas, and uh, we feel the, the importance uh, to, to step back and to, to do this regional work again. There is a lot of uh, 
uh, document that exists and I think that's where uh, um, both from UK and Norway side there are some efforts by the industry and by the regulatory to make a lot of data available. Our capacity to digest and access this data we believe is really key to, to, to step back and, and be able to, to zoom on future areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to build on that, uh, we have a similar kind of approach within Shell. Uh, geology doesn't stop at the country borders, but sometimes, or at least in the past, our maps did. And actually, when you were trying to put them together, they didn't, didn't really match. So I, I fully agree. It's, it's making sure that you use all the available data. And actually, with new seismic techniques, you can see things. So it's worthwhile reinvesting in that. Looking at it from the bottoms up, play-based kind of exploration allows you still to find new opportunities, even in a mature basin like the, the North Sea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Charles? Maybe one reflection here also on standardization on the regulator side. I think one of the key learnings from the North Sea Basin is that if you were getting in there and you having regulators in different countries owning the same basin, mm -hmm. being aligned from day one on how will they deal with this, how will they regulate, how will they allow for cross-border developments, etc., I think would be something that I would hope that, that, that regulators and governments would sit down and consider really early mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there has been and there continues to be regular dialogue between regulators, and uh, you know, that goes back many decades. Um, but obviously, there's the, the overprint of different fiscal regimes and uh, the way that uh, the, the philosophy of various governments uh, affects things means that we can't align in all areas. But there's, there's certainly more effort now, I think, into aligning things like data and data access and uh, these various issues. Um, so, so, Dave, going, going back to one of your points uh, that you made about uh, exploring around the infrastructure, you know, given that uh, we need to sustain that infrastructure if uh, you know, various prospects and, I guess, smaller discoveries are going to, to be economic, um, there's a lot of uh, consolidation in the marketplace as well. A lot of assets are changing hands, um, and uh, some of the big companies are shedding those assets in favour of you know, sometimes frontier exploration, sometimes going elsewhere. Um, so we're seeing some consolidation in some areas. Sometimes those assets are going to private equity type companies. Um, so do you, do you, how do you see this is going to affect things? Are we going to see um, fewer companies working, more companies? Um, and, and how can we kind of manage these changes of assets so that we can maximize that production, particularly around the, the infrastructure? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if we'll see a change in... I can't, can't answer in terms of numbers of companies. I imagine, you know, over over time, you know, companies like BP will start to come out of some of the assets. So we're, we're in the process of uh, divesting from um, Magnus and, and some of our infrastructure at the moment. And uh, I mean, we're giving that to, to we're selling to kind of smaller company Inquest. Um, they're already in the basin, so you know, I'm, I'm not sure that's really changing. Um, the the, the critical thing for any new entrant like, is just exactly the same thing that we're taking is trying to get a hub approach to the infrastructure that you hold. So you've got, you understand the capacity of that piece of infrastructure and then you understand what the resource potential of the entire area is around that. And, and mo most, certainly most of the bigger companies are taking that approach. I mean, Shell are doing a good job around Shearwater and I know Total are doing a good job around Delgan Franklin and, and the fields to the north as well, all one in that area. Um, it's critical we do that because it's, you want to, again, you want to try and maximize the throughput on those big pieces of infrastructure to keep them there for as long as possible. So, you know, advice to the smaller companies coming in to take on some of these things is they have to take that approach and not just, not just the, well, they don't have to, they can do what they want. But I would recommend they take that approach and don't just focus on the individual asset that the field sits on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Girl? Uh, in Norway, we see a consolidation now strongly because some of the majors are are leaving uh, anyway they are going in as a, as a partner in uh, an owner in, in smaller companies like OKBP. Uh, so we see a consolidation and, and Exxon also have sold out their their uh, some of their portfolio uh, but at the same time smaller players also come into Norway and so it's a kind of uh, still quite high di diversity uh, on the Norwegian continental shelf. I think that's uh, a part of that is, is the fiscal sh regime and it's uh, very attractive to, to do exploration in Norway. So 
because m many smaller exploration companies still are coming in there. Great. Okay, thank you. So I'm now going to invite uh, Max Browers from Shell to take the stand and uh, give us his presentation. Let's see if you get technology to work. There we go. Perfect. Uh, good morning to all of you. Thanks, Nick, for uh, inviting me, and uh, compliments to the AAGE for holding, again, a, a great conference here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually, before I start saying much more, uh, let me start by saying I'm not planning to make any um, uh, predictions with regards to, to the oil price. Uh, but if you still feel inclined in any kind of way to invest based on what I'm going to say, this slide says don't, please. Okay. If we start thinking about the North Sea, and if we actually listen uh, or read our newspapers, you can get sometimes a little bit depressed. Um, some of the newspapers are saying things like, collapse in crude brings North Sea fields near end of production, or North Sea oil is in the death throes. Um, that's not so great, but I don't think that's really true. That's not my belief. When I actually think of the North Sea, I think of a picture like this. And what I really like about this picture, it actually shows the true integration which we're actually seeing in our, in our industry. What you see here on the right-hand side is actually the Shearwater platform, Central North Sea, and the UK side on production. What you see on the left-hand side is actually a drilling rig. We're actually drilling um, this year an exploration opportunity below the existing Shearwater field. So still looking at that additional potential to extend uh, the field life. Maybe relatively small volumes, but given the existing uh, facility already there, can be very profitable if successful. And what you actually see further in the background is a vessel acquiring seismic. So continued investment uh, into the North Sea, trying to see the new opportunities which were not visible before, thanks to new technology, allows us to open that new chapter time and time again. But before we actually start looking a little bit more about what the future holds and how we can help unlocking that, that next chapter, I think it's worthwhile actually having a look a little bit at the history as well. What you see here on the left-hand side is a histogram with the number of wells drilled in the North Sea. It's around 7,400 over the last 55 years. That's a significant number, clearly a peak in the 80s and 90s has been dwindling somewhat thereafter. And if you actually start looking at the overall creaming curves of the North Sea, you see indeed in those early years the, vol the big volumes where were found, and you might actually get a little bit of an impression on that multi-year creaming curve over the 55 years that things are not that great maybe anymore. But if you actually start zooming in in those last 10 years, what you actually start seeing is the picture which you see on the right-hand side. More than 8 billion barrels of oil was still found in the North Sea in the last 10 years. And you actually see it's not necessarily flattening. Yeah, sure, there are some very large fields to be found, but isn't that actually really exciting that these kind of multi-billion discoveries still can be made uh, in the North Sea? And moreover, I think with the mature basin, as we have it at the moment, there is so much infrastructure um, that actually the small discoveries, which were not profitable in the past, are actually now um, uh, able to be developed in a, in a commercial kind of way. So I think there's still a lot of value to be had, even if the, small, uh, if the discoveries themselves, on average, become smaller. But then the question, of course, is how are we actually making sure we see those additional discoveries? And I really like this picture. Uh, it shows how technology, especially seismic technology in this case, continues to help us. Over the last six years, through new types of acquisition and new types of processing, you see incredible enhancements uh, from what was poorly or not visible at all uh, in 2008 to where we currently are and clearly can see very nice structures. And it's actually this investment in the technology as well as continued uh, investment in actually acquiring this data which allows us to continue to find more stuff than we actually ever thought before. So 
So actually, if we start looking then a little bit more at, at what does it take to, to be successful, I think there are in total around seven different factors which are really important. Some of them were already touched upon, but I think it's important to just go over them again. First and foremost, safety. Safety has and continues and will always be our priority number one. It's not only because safety and, uh, go, goes hand in hand with good business, but it's also, of course, it's a license to operate. We need to continue to work on that, and uh, especially if we go still to newer, deeper, more challenging, challenging place. Another key element for me is really creativity, especially with the basin which is so mature, where you have many players who actually have been there for a long time, have grown to believe certain kind of ideas, dogmas actually start creeping in. What we actually really need is fresh new ideas. People coming fro from universities with different kind of perspectives, maybe pe people from different kind of uh, backgrounds, different kind of diverse kind of workforce, that's really what we, what we need to ensure that those new kind of opportunities, which maybe were never thought of before, are actually pursued. Thirdly, it's actually also the integration with development and operations, and I think the presentation from Dave already touched upon that quite a bit making sure that you actually know what our existing facilities have, when the urge is actually there, what type of pressures, what type of hydrocarbons, and so on, they actually can, can handle. In an ideal case, you actually do just-in-time exploration to make sure you actually feed, uh, feed those fac facilities. And the key point there as well is, of course, as part of that value proposition, maybe for the smaller volumes, if that actually allows you maybe to postpone uh, for example, abandonment of a certain facility or a pipeline or infrastructure, there's a lot of value in that as well. So again, it is really looking at the total integrated value picture, which allows you to, to, to see uh, and uh, make, make the right reasons to, to pursue certain exploration opportunities. Next, technology. I showed you quickly that example of the seismic and how that actually can, can improve what we are doing. But another area to think of is, ex is for example, in, in drilling. Um, we still have really deep HPHT opportunities, and if we actually can make those wells simpler, um, clearly still very safe, we can actually reduce those costs and again pursue things which were not possible before. Similarly, maybe for more difficult rocks, uh, tight rocks, what can we actually do in the North Sea to uh, unlock remaining potential uh, in there? I think that's very relevant. And clearly, uh, we, we are in a, in a business where economics is very important, and the key factor there is cost. So continue to work on cost reductions through technologies, but it might also be synergies which we can work on, or maybe benefits of scale through cooperation which we can work on, as well as all, uh, individual programs. And Shell, we are working on a program called Fit for the Future, which is really trying to help us take all the little bits of costs out and all the small, small bits and pieces actually do help to make projects which previously were maybe not viable, make them viable again. And the key other factor in that clearly is also reducing the cycle time, i.e. the time between discovery to first production. And I think uh, we continue to learn in that area and make things uh, better as well. Next, on the commercial side. Um, I think we are in an industry, and actually like the, the comment uh, a moment ago before, that we see new players coming in. They have different kind of business models. They have different kind of, uh, of drivers. And I think even the established players like ourselves, maybe some of the service companies, if we start working in a slightly different kind of way together, found different kind of ways of maybe sharing the risk as well as the rewards, we might be able to do things which we haven't uh, done before. And last but not least, it's also on the fiscal side, or if you, if you like, maybe making a, a link back to, to, to Nick. It's, of course, also what can be done in that area to, first of all, provide the stability and the transparency, what, uh, what is going to, to, to happen to make sure we know the return on our investments, but what additional things can be potentially be done there as well to actually stimulate uh, more risk-taking, that innovation, as, uh, as I mentioned before. So let me then conclude with that and just th be very clear. Um, Shell has been a cornerstone for the last 55 years in, in the North Sea. We help to deliver uh, lots of energy, uh, create jobs, and be uh, of great economic benefit for the countries uh, of the North Sea, and we pl plan to continue to do that. We see large remaining potential, and we look forward together with you on unlocking that. Thank you. Thank you, Max.
Okay, so I'm getting some questions in. They're not, uh, not sometimes real time, but, uh, but I'll do my best to go over them. But uh, so we have a question here about, um, I guess, cost reduction. Uh, so there's a certain amount of uh, cost deflation has already taken place um, across the world. Uh, and there's also true cost reduction and various initiatives to, to really reduce costs. Um, so the question is, how can we reduce costs but uh, not put safety at risk? Uh, what can we do to, to mitigate the risk that uh, safety will be, be put uh, in harm's way by those cost reduction initiatives? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a very important one. Um, and it might be easy to see or run the risk actually a, a in that area. But as, a, as I said before, uh, and I truly believe, and Shell truly believes, that good safety performance and good business truly go hand in hand. Uh, if you have good safety performance, you have a good business and, and the other way around this, uh, as well. But I, I don't want to, to marginalize this. Uh, it really requires uh, good leadership in this kind of area in setting very clearly and continuing to repeat that message, yes, we are looking for opportunities to reduce costs, but it should not impact safety. And continuing that message and actually working to individual issues as they come up, we can make the right kind of choices, but it requires attention from, from all leaders or everybody involved in this to be aware what potential cost reductions can do and make sure we make the right call there. Okay. Have any other views on preserving safety? Yeah, this is something that uh, we at MERSC are exceedingly passionate about and I think it's, it's uh, I think linking safety and uh, inefficiency together as something that is opposite to each other is we simply cannot see it in the data we have. We can see that when we go in and do intelligent cost reductions then we also make our uptimes higher and our safety performance better. Uh, we see that across our asset base, we can see it on a quarterly basis, you know, so on, on a yearly basis. It's whether it's in the UK or in Denmark or in Qatar, it's, uh, it's prominent. So for us, it's about leadership. It's the way you lead that, uh, that uh, conscious taking out of cost, making sure that people are busy doing the right things and uh, just the right things. The focus that comes with it, I think, mm -hmm. is really valuable and helpful. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we are exactly in the same space. We, we link the safety and uh, operational efficiency. Um, safety at total is a core value, so it means it's, there is no compromise on safety. But uh, still we are chasing uh, large uh, and important cost reduction, but we, we, we see safety as a cornerstone and uh, a cost reduction uh, to be found through other ways. And I think this is where uh, I really believe the, the North Sea has been um, um, a pioneer in terms of uh, oil and gas uh, development uh, for uh, decades. Uh, and uh, I really believe it's a place where we, we shall be able to reinvent ourselves in terms of uh, achieving cost reduction uh, with leveraging technology, innovation, new contractual framework, uh, uh, cooperation, new business model with our contractors through risk sharing um, uh, without any compromise on, on safety. And uh, we, have, uh, we have been able to, to drill very complex wells uh, uh, recently uh, at Total in uh, HPHT in a very efficient manner. Uh, no compromise on safety and, and good uh, effort on cost. So I really believe it's, uh, it's something that that is manageable. Yeah, in fact, uh, to add something there is, um, um, if you look at, was, we've had a f uh, few very tough years during the downturn, and, uh, and there was a very large concern from the industry about uh, letting safety slip, and, and actually the opposite has happened uh, during the downturn. Our, our safety performance has actually improved during this period, which is amazing, right? Uh, personally, our own safety performance has been exceptional d during this period. So, I think that everyone is very, very aware that uh, that safety could slip, and uh, especially during times like this. And they have actually put emphasis on what not to happen, and it's clearly bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had, uh, heard a comment the other day, which is maybe not uh, not applicable to the way you do things in uh, in every company, but uh, the comment was. You'd be amazed of the power of a clipboard offshore and somebody going around and, uh, and making sure that things are, are done in the right way, but also 
uh, actually empowering individuals to, uh, to to control things and have an influence on safety uh, themselves. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's absolutely getting into the individuals' heads. It's, it's what we need to do because the, the regulations, the safety management systems that all companies have got are are good, and and just. <laughs> As leaders, we just have to get inside people's heads to make sure that they, they follow the procedure and when they see something's not safe, they stop the job and they've got their complete support to do that. It's, I mean, it's that act of leadership that's critical, critical here because, because you know, people are distracted. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, we, we have a technology question here from the floor and uh, I'm sure we'll come back to technology later, but Max, you showed uh, some, some great examples of uh, seismic and uh, how it's improved uh, with different survey types, different uh, processing, and uh, uh, con continually getting better. Um, so the, the question is, technology is one of the key drivers for moving technical resources into sanctioned resources, as uh, Dave was saying earlier. Um, how can we take, how can we encourage operators to take on potentially expensive technologies? Um, I think as, as an industry, we are used to taking risks in subsurface as well as in technology. So I don't think it, it is something which we're not doing already. Uh, it is sometimes, especially maybe in the mature kind of basins where we're thinking more, okay, this could be actually the, 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 the last chapter. Start realizing actually there's much more to come. Yes, we haven't seen actually what those exact chapters are, but actually seeing the replication value of some of those technologies, the what if, might actually be the, uh, a reason for actually doing it, or maybe not even in the North Sea, but if you can start seeing how it can be replicated uh, in other parts uh, of, of the globe, that might be something. There are alternative approaches. If a technology is too expensive to, de to, to develop, joint industry projects could be a good opportunity, or maybe working together another kind of commercial structure. You mentioned actually some things which are even as regulator stimulating in that area. So I don't necessarily think that actually cost necessarily should be the inhibitor. It is the overall potential price, chance of it being successful versus the cost, which should be the right kind of equation um, to, to look at that opportunity. And then again, a different kind of commercial structures there might be opportunities to still pursue it. But I think if you look what our industry has done over the 100 plus years with regards to innovation, it's truly incredible. And we need to continue to do that and believe ourselves that we actually can continue to push that technology boundary. Yeah. Crow? Yeah, but I, I believe that if you, are, if you are going to compress the line uh, between the timeline, between uh, discovery and production, then I believe that we at least as an industry have to invest earlier in high quality data. So I think that could, in a way, change the, the way of working and the way of and our strategy when it comes to, to use some more, much as a high technology data. And that could be, uh, for instance, in infrastructure, where you, where you have the infrastructure and where volumes or new volumes are, are, are needed. Uh, it could be to be, it could create high value, in fact, to, to be uh, able to invest earlier in mm -hmm. high quality data, yeah. seismic data. Yeah. So uh, another point uh, allied to this is uh, the multi-client seismic companies, spec companies have uh, been put under great amount of pressure in the last years, um, yet they've put a lot of effort into technology development themselves, have taken on risk. Uh, sometimes to a, to a level that's uh, very uncomfortable for them. So I is there something that can be done, particularly by operators, um, but perhaps by others to, to support, uh, I guess, speculative seismic acquisition, multi-client seismic acquisition, or do you, do you think it's purely the domain of, uh, of operators to, to provide the funding and the impetus? I think... Uh there might be opportunities to work with different kind of, uh, of business models. Um, actually, in discussions with, with some of the seismic operators, they've indicated if the oil companies as, as a whole, the operators, can provide more clarity about their longer-term plans, their overall level of investments, that might give them a little bit longer visibility of what's likely coming up, and that might be something which actually we collectively can work on. Uh, as you, you say, um, and as you saw in that, that, that picture as well, for uh, the operators, it is crucial to have seismic companies and we want to have a healthy pool of, of, of seismic acquisition companies to make sure that they also have the healthy amount of competition themselves and keep their own technology pushing forward. So I think there's something to be done with a larger level of cooperation. 
uh, between uh, the seismic companies and, uh, and uh, the oil companies to make sure that that healthy kind of ecosystem uh, remains. Mm -hmm. Charles? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that's, that's a crucial part uh, to do. But I also do think that there's something for us, for this room, uh, to do. Uh, and that's maybe internally in our own businesses of making absolutely sure that we can promote brand and create transparency into the value creation of, of, uh, of advised, oh, sorry, advanced seismic acquisition programs. I think it's not necessarily, it's, it's still relatively big ticket items and the understanding of the value of them is still a little bit immature as you move up the executive ladders, at least that's what I find. So trying to use events like this, uh, our common knowledge uh, to, to promote the value of this uh, to uh, investors really. I think we have some untapped potential there uh, and we are, we are as geoscientists and engineers, possibly a little bit too introspective and introvert. We need to brand ourselves harder and I think mm -hmm. that'll help it because at the end of the day, it, we're not going to acquire more seismic if we can't prove that it makes a lot of sense to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we have something Great. to do. Good. So Charles, I'll, I'll let you take the, uh, the stage now because uh, you have a very technology-focused uh, talk. So uh, and, uh, another great example of, uh, of seismic on there as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me see if I can get this too. Good morning, and thanks for being here. Uh, is it up and running? Yeah. Thanks for being here this morning. It's really a great pleasure to come, uh, come to the EAG and, and not least come to Paris on, on a sunny day like this. Uh, beautiful and uh, great organization. Thanks to the EAG for such a professional way of, uh, of framing this, uh, this event. As I said, I'll, I'll speak into... Uh, you've, you've heard... Uh, the previous speakers provide really good context actually for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, you've heard Max showing the first glimpse of, of technology here, but also covering the, the full aspects of what is required for the basin. Uh, Isabel said a good, good basin context for us as well. And, uh, and David talked about the challenge of, of uh, really getting uh, volumes to move in from, uh, from, from discoveries actually being discovered, but moving them into production at a pace and rate that is required. So I'm going to talk into the, uh, the, some aspects and with four examples of, uh, of how technology can help us do that. Um, and with the, uh, with the basis in the experience that we have at Mask Oil, we are a, a clearly a technology-led company. We've created our, the value uh, th over time through innovation, particularly in the space of technology. And uh, we believe that there's still uh, ample opportunity for us. At least we have assets in the North Sea. We're in Sverdrup, in Kalena, as was mentioned before, and a couple of important Danish fields uh, that we know will last way into the 2040s. So there is already there quite a big future. We just need to keep on filling the hopper. For us at Mask Oil, the, uh, the, the, the real challenge of technology is not so much to, to, it is to really be smart about how we take cost out of the system. And taking cost out of the system is not just about cutting cost. I think there's a very distinct limit to what you can do. But it's about using modern technology to be more efficient. And, the, uh, and that can be done in many different ways. And the four examples I will give you provide four themes that are slightly different in terms of how that can be looked at. The first one is from the, uh, from the exploration domain, and there what we've, uh, what we've tried out is actually to say, let's look back and see are there any technologies that uh, we've sort of forgotten, but uh, can start to add value to us again. And here is an example of, of, uh, of a joint seismic and gravity uh, inversion uh, from uh, airborne uh, FGD data that uh, really has helped us to create a much better, sharper image to go after and de-risk uh, smaller opportunities near existing fields. So the data is there, you can see it. It's, uh, it gives us a, a, a significant and low-cost opportunity to uh, pursue additional barrels. But of course, sometimes the, uh, we're not really looking just at saving cost. And when you have really big discoveries and, and uh, and the cost focus is not the primary one. 
It is getting things done right and de-risking the big investments that are going to happen uh, going forward. And here, for our Colane HPHT discovery, with where BP, amongst others, are, are, are va highly valued partners, uh, the partnership went in and uh, decided to acquire a, a, a uh, ultra-high-density uh, OBC node survey uh, over the field. That, and you can see the data for yourself here. A, a remarkable improvement in the, uh, in the resolution at depth. We, we saw uh, Max talk about that at Shearwater as well, uh, which allowed us to make very different decisions. Uh, and in HPHT, your ability to drill wells later in the, uh, in the development is, is limited. So knowing that up front, having a clear view on the total potential early on was really paramount. And it has helped us to accelerate as well and have confidence in acceleration of the development of the field uh, and doing it right. Uh, and here I think this is a great example of also promotion right up to the chain of management to really be confident about sticking your neck out as technical people and say, this will make a difference, and it, it does. It made a huge different difference for us. Another good seismic example, really from the development operations application. We, uh, we've worked a lot on, uh, on improving our 4D capability inside of, of our company, and with the great help of, of, of super competent uh, uh, supply chains and uh, seismic uh, acquisition vendors. But here, for us, the, the real value comes from full life cycle planning and getting the data in early, high quality, early design, repeating it, but also having the integration right from the acquisition, working diligently with the contractor over good, solid processing through world-class uh, QI work, but also integrating with the operations people, those that produce the field day in and day out. And I think what you see here is a, a pretty remarkable 4D effect on a, in a very, very difficult place in the chalk in the North Sea that doesn't lend itself well to 4D uh, signatures. But here, this uh, creates value for us every day, in and out, by making better decisions, better interventions, opening, closing zones, uh, and targeting uh, bypassed oil. One other good way of, in an economically responsible way, creating additional value from, uh, from these fields. The last example I'll give you is an example of moving, really looking outside so we are drilling these long horizontal wells. It's, a, it's, it's what we do. And in their own right, they, have become, they are really efficient compared to, much more expensive, but very efficient compared to the regular, normal, vertical or deviated wells. And we drill them extremely long, of course. But even though we thought we were the best and experts in this, when we took a chance and looked outside and looked to the, to the boom in the US and the uh, and the, uh, the oil shale industry over there, we actually saw that there were technologies and ways of working that we could deploy right back into our own business. And uh, we're currently in the process of doing that. Uh, and we uh, were, at least in the beginning, not humble enough to, to take that step. But, but a bit of pressure uh, helped that. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that we, uh, with that, will be able to unlock a number of much smaller discoveries than we've previously been able to develop, simply because we can bring the horizontal well and completion cost down by 40, 50 percent. That's a lot of money, just from basically looking outside and looking to others. And I think that's the, 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 uh, the lesson for me here as well, that we can still do much more on that, not just looking inside our industry, but actually looking outside. Uh, and in these examples, I've completely avoided talking about the, wor the role of digital and automation. I think that's a very, very big technology chapter. I will be super happy to discuss that, but that would probably have taken me another 20 minutes and uh, I would have been thrown off the stage by then. Um, but, in, but in conclusion here, the, uh, I've shown you really four, four good examples of what technology leadership can look like that can rejuvenate our basin. Uh, and make the North Sea great again, I guess you would say. Um, but through looking back, don't overlook, your, don't overlook past, uh, past technologies. In a new digital world, they may come to life again. Invest big when big investments are required and take risk and promote technology in that space. Large investments can pay off and will pay off when they're targeted and right. 
And then, of course, the, the role of, of integration with other disciplines. The 40 is the, is the best example, and the, for us, that has really been uh, what will help us to have a field there that can, can live way into the 2040s. And then, of course, learning from others. I think that's a, a really, really key thing. We can do that amongst the group that is here, but we do need to look outside as well. Outside the, t outside the basin and outside the businesses. Lots to be learned, and I think the digital agenda is probably the most prominent one where we will be forced to learn from others to be successful. Thank you for your time. Just one last comment. Next year, in, at this time, we'll be in Copenhagen, and uh, the uh, Copenhagen LAC will really, really love to see you there. It's going to be great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, so you, you show some really nice examples there. Um, obviously, we're, we're creating lots more data on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, essentially. And uh, the types of data are changing as well uh, and, and growing. And I guess the, the, the value can be gained by taking those different data sets, as you showed in one of your examples. You're taking gravity data and seismic data and then combining them to get the full effect of them. Um, so I guess what can be done to really share those different data types, and maybe not just the data types within companies, but across company boundaries, how can we facilitate that, that data sharing to get maximum benefit from it? I think that's you, you, that, that is, of course, a very interesting dilemma, because at, on one hand, you, we, we, uh, we look to be competing with each other on the, on, on the effective application of, of, uh, of data, but I... So one of the ways that we've decided to do that is to, to, uh, to uh, for instance, we've, we've pushed quite some sums into a long-term investment in a, in a research and technology center at the university in Denmark, where we, where we one of the key things we do there is that we, uh, uh, we uh, are pretty liberal about the way we uh, let the center use data from our uh, operations, mm -hmm. uh, from our business. Um, and then it's the, the other really special thing about it is that the results of the research is, is public. So we don't hold on to it, it's public. We've decided that that's a, it's a better way for us to get, pe get other companies and other, uh, from the supply chain in particular, in to, to help look at our data in a neutral environment, uh, covered in the, by the appropriate uh, levels of confidentiality, but with results coming out and benefiting everybody. But I think we need to be a little innovative about how we break down those barriers while we recognize that, com that the commercial barriers are there and they need to be there. They're there mm -hmm. for good reasons. There are limits to how much you can do, but find smart new ways of trying to be more transparent and more yeah. sharing. Yeah. Okay. Dave, you got any perspectives on how we can get better value out of our data? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, I think not, all, not all data we've got is a, a source of competitive advantage for us. So I think well, we've got data, data sources that we can share fairly easily, then we need to be taking advantage of that. And uh, yeah, we've kind of touched on digital a little bit, but one project that the UK operators are trying to work just now is, is about the sharing logistics data. So marine vessel uh, utilization in terms of kind of what goods they carry, how frequently they carry it to various different geographies around the, the basin. And what we're working towards at the moment is trying to build a digital model that will help us optimize that. So at the moment, each operator has their own boat and it kind of sails out quite often 25% you know, utilized. So there's clear opportunity to try and get the operators to work together to, to, to optimize the use of supply boats. And it's not, it's not a difficult thing to do. The starting point is you know, our willingness to share that information and then create the technology that allows us to take advantage of it. And, and that, that could be quite significant, right? So you have maybe just have one boat that delivers, you know, toilet rolls and burgers around the North Sea or something like that, and uh, another boat. Maybe bespoke stuff go out to the, you know, out, out to specific facilities for, for specific reasons. But there's a definitely a very different approach that we could use to to do that, and that's about your sharing data. And it brings a cost down for everybody. If you get the cost down for everybody, you go back to the resource progression piece. Your facilities last for longer, and you get more recovery, and that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Yeah. Grow. Yeah, uh, I think it would have uh, definitively been important to be able to share more data, but of course then it could also affect the business model between the, the supplier of the data and, and the oil companies and so on, but uh, it's, it's a very good uh, 
or should I say ID and uh, and, uh, and and you know started to, to think how we could do this differently but I also have to say that uh, based upon my own experience is that also as an oil company we today are not able to utilize all of our own data and especially I believe because it's so hard to find them uh, and uh, we are working we are working of course now on, on digitalization and and analytics and so on but uh, there is a huge amount of data that we are not using in fact today uh, as an industry I would <laughs> rather try to or uh, tend to say so uh, it's uh, important that we uh, really uh, in that context uh, really step up over um, internal also processes when it comes to digitalization and, and so on just to to acknowledge and, and use uh, all the data we have and especially within exploration might be that uh, uh, some sort of production data we do not utilize them in a way that really could have created new ideas uh, I believe and there are many other data sets too so, yeah. so do you think there's a case for more open data and more standard open data formats that we, we can all share? Yeah, I would have hoped that we could uh, come so far that we could have an open uh, uh, open data database uh, or a, at least uh, the same standard so it could be easier to, to, to share them, at least the data we can share. So uh, um, that, that would really have been a prerequisite, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd say from a, a regulator's perspective, I think there's a lot we could do to reduce costs and a lot of the, I guess, uh, expended effort on managing data if we all use the same data store. And uh, there's obviously efforts in various places to create stores of data that sit in the cloud, um, but that, I guess, needs the will of those who hold the data to actually put it in there. Um, and I guess a, a, ch a challenge to you is if, if there are bits of data that you're not using uh, and studies that you've done in the past uh, and you don't require them anymore, do you, do you give them up, essentially? Do you let others use them so they can get full value? Yeah, I believe there, there's, there's absolutely room in that area and we've only started uh, to, to explore what is really possible there. But this is clearly also the corollary, as we were saying earlier, you still want people to invest in new data as well. And because we're still all, uh, in a way, in competition at the same time as well, you need to find a way that certain bits of data are still retained for each company long enough to get a return on that additional investment, especially if it's a little bit more risky, as we were saying earlier, trying innovative kind of technologies. So I think there's absolutely room there, but uh, we have work to do on getting to a right business model for it. Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, another question from the floor is um, associated with reducing cycle time. We can use technology um, and introduce new technologies, but uh, the, the comment is our industry is very conservative. Um, so one, do you think that's the case? And then if it is the case, what can we do to be less conservative uh, and then introduce those new ideas faster. Charles? I, I think it's whether, whether the industry is conservative or not, I think it's what, is it, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, I, think we, I think we've taken some, historically, we have been able to take some really bold steps uh, from time to time. And maybe it's worth going back and learning a little bit about what created the opportunity for doing that. I think if, we, if I can, uh, this is probably one of the areas where I think there is a, a uh, a role for the regulator as well, uh, in because I think one of the barriers that we see is is uh, uh, for testing is to is to test and, and de-risk new technology and they're putting it out there in in, a, in an environment where the where the, the cost of operation is phenomenal and the and the risk is is uh, is, is big and therefore it's almost like exploration, right? You uh, you, you treat it that way and uh, therefore I think that could. You, sh you should think about whether there are special incentives required for, for, for testing and certainly promotion of, of new technology testing in, mm -hmm. in field, in the, uh, in the real world, uh, considering those, uh, those different metrics that, that goes with it. Mm -hmm. High risk, uncertain reward. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think, I think most governments have some sort of system whereby they can encourage collaboration, development of new intellectual property, um, you know, there's a big kind of patent system which is, uh, you know, more or less equal across various regions. Um, 
but also there's, there's, as I mentioned earlier, match funding from government, various ways of dealing with it in the, in the fiscal regime. So, um, I mean, the, the question really is for industry to say, well, is that sufficient for our needs to overcome some of those hurdles to invest in new technology, or is there something else that needs to be done there? And then flag that to the authorities so that actually they can work it into the system. Um, so, you know, we're, we're an advisor to Treasury, but uh, we can also advise uh, you know, in other areas beyond the, the kind of standard fiscal regime. I mean, I, th I, mean I, you know, I, I absolutely agree we are conservative. And uh, it, it's only when necessity comes along that we seem to think we need to innovate. And uh, I would say we're in that situation now, given the numbers I showed you on the resource progression, um, you know, and us being able to stay competitive in the, in the, you know, in the, in the deployment of capital across the globe. I mean, the one area we're not embracing yet is, is digital, and we kind of talked on that a little bit, but, but other sectors are, are all over this. The banking sector has been transformed by digital. Shopping has been transformed by digital. Most of you buy your stuff on Amazon or various outlets like that these days rather than going to a shop. Entertainment has been transformed, and our business is still kind of lagging miles behind. And it's important that we start to think about what that, what that means for us. Technological advances in digital space is absolutely exponential. But our capacity is kind of growing linearly, and there's a massive gap open up to what's possible in that space and our attitude towards it, which is partly driven by conservatism and partly driven by ignorance. And it's really important that we start to get our heads around that, understand what that opportunity is, and then put the structures in place that allow us to realize the benefit of it. Because it is one of the things that could generally be transformative for the basin if we can use those digital techniques to either unlock more barrels or reduce more cost, that, that can make a difference for the basin. But for some reason, the sector's not really embracing it yet. We're doing things individually, but you go back to the point around collaboration. The more, the more we collaborate together, the more data you have available to you, the more data they have, the more you can optimize an outcome. And that's certainly true of cost. That, the, the example I give around supply chain is, is a good example of that. We've got to, got to find a way, and I don't know, I don't, there isn't a silver bullet, I don't think, but it's getting companies to open up the possibility that, that something exists in this space, so adjust your mindset and try and close the, the gap between you know, how, how, what the potential of digital technologies are versus how our, our capacity to realize what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you. So, so Gro, you're going to touch on this in your, uh, your presentation now, so uh, yeah. I'd like to take the stand. First of all, uh, thank you for being inviting here. It's, uh, it's a great arrangement and it's great to, to be here uh, with you all. Um, well, it's, um, we have been through very much of what I'm going to say and it could be that this is a, at a bit high level, but I'm sure that we will also uh, get a good discussion uh, here anyway. Uh, but uh, as we see it, uh, the industry now has been renegotiating and, and tuning uh, our activities. And, but in a way, these are very easy wins in, in a dumb term. Uh, and we strongly believe, which also has been mentioned here earlier, that uh, deeper changes may be required uh, to create a substantially more competitive ENP uh, industry. So uh, the changes that are required also demands a cultural change and a change of mindset, uh, both uh, of the organization and the people. So what we do really want and try now is to change uh, the business model. And that is also to reduce waste, uh, take away the bottlenecks, uh, try to at least, and reduce cost and also compress the resource timeline as we already have been into. And I also have to emphasize that this is not going to compromise on the safety. Uh, successful exploration, and now I'm talking about on the, uh, also including the whole continental or Norwegian continental shelf, 
because it requires uh, utilization of current infrastructure. And we see that is kind of challenged in the Barents Sea, which are much, much less mature. Uh, whereas Nor uh, the, the North Sea is, uh, is, a, is a very mature basin. But then it's also about trying to think new and try to cluster. It could also be stranded discoveries, but also new smaller discoveries, and then thereby being able to, to create new hubs. And uh, an important prerequisite for doing that is investment in both uh, high quality data and, and technology. Uh, furthermore, uh, we really also need to improve the pace we develop the resources and how we do it then. So, as I also have been alluded to, high quality data investment is really a key here in early phase. That could support opportunity detection. That means that we understand better the opportunity we have and also the risk earlier. And we can have an earlier maturation of subsurface which again enable rapid progression of resources. We have also looked into our drilling uh, performance a uh, couple of years now and uh, see that it provides large opportunity in, in reducing also the finding cost. And that's really important for us uh, because then we are also able to drill more wells for the same uh, figures. So current performance in drilling were not thought possible uh, only a few years ago and from earlier industry average of 84 meters per day, we have recorded 285 meters a day on our last operated exploration well in 2016. And we further expect uh, improvement, but of course no compromise on HSE. And it is a key enabler for globally cost competitive exploration and development project. Uh, also that we increase the number of commercial finds. So successful exploration is not worth a lot without being able uh, to lift the discovered resources in a globally competitive, into a globally competitive development project. Uh, a part of this is also to make the right discoveries at the right commercial deals and not at least alignment of ownership in the licenses or in the licenses to progress a project but more radical may be required to progress over discovered resources below a break-even uh, cost of $35 per barrel at a shorter time. New project delivery models and digitalization might be some of these enablers, changing the way we have been working until now. Uh, today, industrial cooperation and work uh, between customers and suppliers uh, are to a large degree contained in silos and supplier side and optimize their contracts and work to their end and we as operators and customers work also in the same way. So typically we develop parallel organizations and multiple duplications of positions and tasks and the documentation level and engineering hours is just skyrocket. So we really want to reorganize the value chain and we have, RKBP, already formed an alliance uh, to deliver subsea projects and work is ongoing also to form an alliance for platforms. Uh, so this is another initiative that we strongly believe will deliver development project below 35 barrel, uh, uh, dollar per barrel break even. So what we are doing then, in fact, are we are creating one team working in the alliances, characterized by client and supplier uh, work together in joint organization and common budget for scope of the work. And it's also about the best man for, or the women <laughs> for the job. So bringing alliances models to other parts of the work streams, like within exploration, uh, when it comes to seismic processing and imaging, data acquisition, etc., may also turn out for us to be more efficient and even also give higher quality. So reduce time then, it could on documentation for contracts and non-productive activities, making slides for each other, but also then work on building uh, trust and relationships. 
So there is a potential to reduce the time and to reduce cost and improve quality at the same time. But it might be that we have to work differently. Hello. Right. So we have a question on uh, alliance models, and uh, I think we're going to revisit this as well in the, in the frame of decommissioning. So Nico's going to talk a bit about how, we'll, I guess, the EMP organisations work together with the supply chain. Um, now, these sorts of alliances have been tried in the past, um, varied success. What, what, what do you think is different now, and, and how can you make these alliances successful? I believe that they are more deeply, you know, we, we, we dare to think about that we have to build trust together and we are uh, putting, uh, or, um, putting people uh, in the same room, so to say then. So we are working as one team and I don't believe that we have worked so closely before. Uh, and we have a different kind of incentives between the supplier and the uh, and, and the, uh, the oil company, the customer. Uh, so I think that we, we share risk uh, uh, both si on both sides. And we have different risk, but we share also risk and we also then share uh, eventually upsides. And we also then use the best man or woman on, on the job. And I believe that if the best uh, man or woman come from a supplier, we use the supplier as a project leader in the project. So it's a kind of, we have a common goal and ambition and we work it together. But of course it depends that we trust each other and, uh, and, it, and it takes time also to, 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 uh, to set up such a way of working. And it's about culture and it's also about culture in our company. Uh, so, and it's about leadership in fact. So you, you have also to have a strong leadership in order to, to, to make that work in, in, a, in a most efficient uh, way. Charles? Mm -hmm. First, I just recognise AKPP for for the for, for what you're doing in this space. I think it's 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 interesting. It's great to watch, I, and I think it holds a lot of promise. But I do agree as well that that culture is a, and actually probably all company culture more than anything else being one of the key barriers to this. For for us, I think we've tried it, but more in sort of a macro space. And others, I think, will have done it too. I'm thinking of of in-house processing centres, for instance which I think is, is actually a microcosm of exactly this. You invite the, a, 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 a contractor into your office to work in your team with you in a very, very highly integrated fashion on the most secretive parts of your portfolio. But you can, we have been able to manage that and create, I think, great value from that. So why, I think it's, it's good that, some, that you are experimenting. Hopefully yeah. that we can uh, join you. So the uh, question is, uh, do, you, do you think you could apply this model to a, to a joint venture um, rather than just the relationship between suppliers and EMP companies? But if you're on a license with partners, why, why do you not get in the same room together and, uh, and work on that particular license and uh, the resources associated with it? Um, I, mean, I guess an observation from, from my perspective is you, uh, you often see companies applying for a license together and they're all on very friendly terms and as the license progresses, uh, everybody falls out with each other and uh, that can, can result in at the end of the day a lot of, lot of friction within that joint venture group so c could you apply this within, uh, within those JVs? I don't, I don't recognise that comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think um, there's a couple of things that happen. I think, I think there's a potential model where you could do that. So you know, we work in a couple of big JVs with uh, you know, multiple companies who are all really high quality companies We've all got separate subsurface teams doing their own work, and it's pretty inefficient, actually. So, you know, you really want to drive out one team because that would drive some alignment through there. The difficulty sometimes comes when, when you've got corporate, corporate factors that are misaligned, and that, that drives then the misalignments down the teams. So I think there's things you could do definitely around uh, alliancing on technical, technical work, and you'd, you'd, you'd overall reduce the cost base mm. for... Uh, for uh, for the asset, I guess. Um, but the tricky thing is where you start to get corporations that are misaligned. That, that, that's difficult. Yeah. Who's got CapEx, who hasn't got CapEx? Yeah. Max? 
Yeah, I think there are clear examples where this may be uh, working as you describe it, but there are clear examples where it's working the other way around as well. And it all starts with deep underlying behaviors and trust, as you said very correctly. And I think we all have a role to play to recognize actually when we maybe get in that downward spiral and stop it and actually take a moment and start saying, hey, what are we collectively really trying to do there? Yes, there might be bigger corporate kind of drivers, but it doesn't help any of us if we try to find that within the particular license. What is it really we can jointly do here to maximize the value and create a win-win situation out of it? But that requires an ability sometimes to step away, which is difficult if you're already halfway down that, 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 that spiral. But I think, again, I see a shift more towards more focus on behaviors. It comes through a lot of the discussion here, actually, today. More collaboration, realizing that actually we need each other in many different kind of ways, which is encouraging. Yeah. Is, Isabel, can you maybe comment on what, what happens within a company, I guess, uh, in terms of how you collaborate internally? Yes, <clears throat> so I think we, uh, I think this model is very interesting. Uh, we, we are uh, having some pilots where we, we are trying to, to be much more collaborative and inclusive, I would say, especially with the, with the contractors. Um, we have to fight uh, the procurement. I think f for me it's mainly the, where you have uh, uh, locking uh, point, I would say, but uh, uh, with a relationship and trust, I think we, we are moving forward. Uh, on the GVs, uh, I think as you, you mentioned, uh, they, the, the strategic alignment of the companies is really a, a key point on the asset where we, we want to do that. Um, but I would say, I think we, we are showing we are able to collaborate and probably now it's time to, to make a, a step further. And I think the, the model uh, you, you described is very interesting and, uh, and there is probably a path to, to, to move forward um, on some assets with pilots and trying to promote this. Yeah. Nico, you have a comment? Yeah, um, I'd like to comment a little bit on, uh, on, on what you said about uh, working together with the supply chain and having uh, a, a trusted part of the supply chain within the operator organization. Um, and it's very feasible, uh, um, you know, as long as the objectives are, are the same. Uh, for example, we've just uh, recently done uh, a project like that uh, um, offshore in the Atlantic, uh, where we helped de-risk a, a prospect. And, um, and we made sure that our objectives were aligned uh, and that, uh, that, we, um, that we had skin in the game. Uh, and in that way, you can very well work together uh, towards the same, uh, same objective, you know, and so far it's been very successful, right? Time will tell, you know, in the end, but it is very possible and, it's a, it's a, and I think it's a new way of working that previously we've not all been comfortable with. But I think the, as, uh, as we are seeing that, you know, this industry is, is going to be struggling for a little bit of time to come, I don't think we have a choice, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, a uh, question I've um, been posed a lot is, uh, is around, I guess, how, how EMP companies interact with their various suppliers. And uh, one of the comments has been that EMP companies have been very prescriptive over the last few years, and they've said, I want these things, X, Y, Z, you must do it in this way. Do you think it's a, a better model if the EMP companies, especially with their constrained resources, um, they actually say, well, this is the end result I want, and uh, we're going to agree on how we do that in terms of finances, etc. But it's up to you to, to deliver the end product, and it's up to you to find the pathway to deliver that. Uh, definitely, because um, so what is what is critical is that uh, that the scope is is very clearly lined out. What is going to deliver the end result, right? So that everyone knows exactly what boundaries to work with what to do, what not to do, right? Because there's a very big chance of scope creep. You know, any project can go, it can grow arms and legs. As long as that all very, very clearly defined and the end objective is very clearly defined, that is very possible. But it has to be managed very properly, right? Yeah. It's a new way of working, but feasible. Yeah. Thanks. Just to, to do items to build on, uh, on what was just said, actually, 
Um, first of all, if every uh, oil company goes to every s contractor with this is the way it needs to be done, but every oil company goes in with a slightly different kind of way, every time the, the contractor needs to adjust and there is just transaction cost in that. So maybe in the removing some of that actually would be better. The other part of it, I, I think actually again comes back to that keyword trust in here. It shows a, actually a lack of trust and even maybe worse, it doesn't allow any innovation from because actually the contractor doing the job might have a much better way of doing it. And if you don't allow for that kind of dialogue, we don't move forward as an industry. So I think it's important to find ways of actually stepping beyond that and finding a way of having more of a dialogue. How can this job be done best by, by the, all the parties involved? As a company, uh, being still smaller but a more important player of the NCS, I think it's really important that they have this cooperation uh, because uh, because then we also we, we we need more you know competence and deeper understanding of, of different issues. So so for us, I think it's a key just to work closely together and not put it out as a as a as, as a contract uh, for you. So it depends very much on on <coughs> trust, and I I don't understand why we shouldn't try to work together more in, in a team then uh, because I think you also and your industry your part of the industry have, have a lot to, to contribute to to the oil company and also the way we are working and the way we are using the data and and the way of uh, being commercial uh, taking a commercial mindset and so on so I think there could be a lot of of good um, effects coming out of, of, a, of a close cooperation Charles, you have a final comment on that? So my final comment would be that in, we see uh, tremendous potential in integration. We see it at every level within our company. We're doing whatever we can to break down barriers and, and, uh, and create space for integration. I don't know. I think we should challenge ourselves why that should stop at the uh, gates into the, into the offices. Uh, I think that's the, the pledge for me. Be, uh, be bold and, uh, and let's, let's try it out. And then let's learn from each other. So Nico, I'd like to invite you to take the stage now. So uh, Nico's going to talk to us about uh, decommissioning and again uh, how we, we collaborate and uh, work together uh, on this uh, opportunity. Okay, so uh, in the end there's decommissioning and that's why I was put as the last speaker. Um, uh, thank you for waiting this long, you're a very hardy uh, audience clearly. Um, I do not, well, although it's about decommissioning, it's actually more about an integrated business model which we started touching on already, right? Um, because that's really what is going to make a very big difference in, in, in the way we're going to have to work in this industry. So uh, I've deliberately made this print very, uh, very small, so hopefully you can't read it. But, uh, you know, because I don't want you to start looking, okay, what are all the steps that we need to do, right? The, the key message of this slide is um, the conventional model, uh, and especially in, in decommissioning, is that uh, the operator uh, acts like the decommissioning company so to say. Um, they do all the engineering, all the, they write all the programs, uh, they do all the permitting, all the licenses, everything, they do all the logistics, uh, and they're herding the cats, and, and it's a very, very cumbersome task, you know. Uh, although it looks simple, decommissioning is actually very complex, and if you don't do it right the first time, it could be very, very costly, okay? And the key of decommissioning is to keep the cost down and to bring the cost down, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't provide or doesn't make any money, right? It doesn't deliver anything. It's something that we just need to do. So we need to bring the cost down. Okay, so this, the, the operator is trying to herd all these different elements of, of the supply chain and try and make them work together and, ma and make sure that uh, it uh, transitions smoothly from one phase to another phase, right? And, you know, that it, it works with, you know, uh, with the partial success and, and some partial failure as well. All right, so what I really... Uh, I wanted to show is uh, an integrated way of doing this, right? And it is a way of having a, a consortium uh, between the operator and the entire supply chain, right? And the, 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 the whole integration 
um, is, is uh, driven by the consortium agreement, right? Uh, and a steering committee. And the steering committee uh, uh, makes sure that the consortium agreement is adhered by. And it makes sure that all the interface problems are, are not going to uh, appear. Okay, so you have all the, the, the parties that are going to be making sure that, you know, uh, one, uh, what might be a decision of one, uh, uh, one phase, you know, to do something economic, it could actually create a lot of costs in the next phase, right? And that's going to be uh, uh, eliminated that way. So the advantages of, of this approach, okay, of the uh, consortium approach. Um, so the key is that, um, that the consortium very clearly has shared values and objectives, right? And they have to have a common goal. That means that they have to have common benefit as well. Otherwise, it's not going to work, okay? Uh, and uh, you, we'd be tempted to say, okay, let's put everything under uh, one contractor in the supply chain and he'll manage everything and he'll pull everything together, but then you're creating exactly the same problem as you had before, okay? So the best way that we see is that you have individual contractual uh, agreements uh, with the operator, and then you have a, uh, a collaboration agreement or an alliance agreement between all uh, uh, parts of the supply chain, right? And it's a multi-party uh, party agreement that's, that sets out the, the, the principles on how we are going to work together, how we're going to avoid interface problems, and also how are we going to share the benefits, and how are we going to share the penalty, right? Okay, so, um, and this, uh, like I said before, uh, this has to be managed by a steering committee with all parties uh, uh, involved in that, and, and in, the operator has to be part uh, of that steering committee as well, because on the end of the day, that's the party that is going to be held liable for the, uh, in the future. Okay, all right, the benefits. Uh, it's benefits, of one we have, you know, they're spoken of, uh, about a lot, and it's early engagement. Uh, and that necessarily can, can be done in different ways, uh, in different business models as well, but this is clearly uh, uh, an automatic outcome of this, right? Um, it, with early engagement, better solutions can be offered uh, and problems can be foreseen ahead of time, all right? Um, by working together to reduce the cost and complexity between all parties, we can actually get towards a project um, that is, that is uh, at a cost level that is going to be sanctioned, okay? So that's the incentive for everyone to make sure that this project is actually going to work, all right? Um, and uh, I've touched on this already, the, the added value of the, of the collaboration between all parties is our reduced interface issues, right? Like I said, what could be good for one phase could actually cost more for another phase, and we have to avoid that. Um, and what one very uh, big aspect of this is multi-skilling between the different parties, right? It's not just multi-skilling within a certain uh, part of the supply chain, no, between several parts, okay? And the key of that is that this is done in the right way and that there's a company insurance pr uh, uh, program in place. Um, this is not uncommon anymore in the industry. This is happening more and more uh, and is a, is a proven concept and proven to be very cost efficient. Okay, and, uh, um, and uh, by having a, uh, a consortium, you can share logistics and would have a, 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 a tremendous cost saving on that as well. So this is really uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about and start a discussion on. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. Um, so we, we have some questions here that are coming in, so please keep sending them through the app. Um, so, so one question is, um, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's a cost reduction benefit to doing this in a consortium way and doing things in an integrated manner you know, across companies. Um, so is, is there a role for the regulator to play in this, or is it just going to happen naturally? No, it is not going to happen naturally. There is definitely, and if uh, uh, in case of the UK, there is this is uh, uh, very strongly fostered by the OGA, right? And, and we can clearly see the results of that, uh, because if the OGA wouldn't have um, been assisting on on, on uh, this type of approach, uh, a lot of parties would not have been as open to that. And 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 we are talking with several. Uh, other uh, parts of the supply chain as well as operators at the moment 
to make this happen, right? And, and I think that is largely because, uh, because of the fostering of the OGA. So they definitely have a role to play. Without that, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, what Nico talked about was, it seemed to me, decommission a moral for an asset, a de a, a decommission an asset. There's a, there's a piece about us understanding the whole of the basin and what is the, what is the, what is the phasing and the key drivers look like for, for the assets. And the, re the regulator's got a role to play there, I think. Nick, in terms of us understanding what that scope looks like. And from that, we should be able to identify synergies between assets in terms of timing, uh, types of decommissioning that might have to be, take place. So there, there is something there about you know, encouraging us to get on the front foot in terms of planning sufficient time ahead of COP, but then share that, share the timing and share the, share the challenges of the drivers that we, that we face around decommissioning. Yeah. Because once you have that collective view, you can start to take you know, a macro integrated approach to the decommission of the basin, which, yeah. which has got to be where there's a huge cost lever. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I agree. You know, it's, it's very easy for explorers to say, well, decommissioning has nothing to do with me. But there's, there's one, I guess, the impact on, well, if I'm going to contract a rig for some activity, can it be used elsewhere to good effect, um, particularly in the same area? Uh, and then two, obviously, for the explorer, there's the question of, well, if, if infrastructure is going to be taken down, I need to know what that forward plan is so that I can bring those um, targets forwards if necessary and, uh, and if I'm able to. Yeah. Any other questions on that? So more more a, a comment or a, a, a challenge here, and I'm not sure that this uh, setup necessarily in itself supplies that, but I think one of the challenges is to get enough mass and, and profitability into this space to allow uh, real uh, cost reductions to take place. Uh, for instance, in the area of, of uh, well decommissioning, which I think is one of the most critical areas where there still is, is big risk, and getting, getting up the learning curve there and, and having clear targets for companies with a, with a, with a uh, long-term horizon to take the cost of that and down to at least half of what it is today. Uh, there's real value of that for, for the companies. There's tremendous value in that, I think, for the mm -hmm. UK PLC in particular, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the big abandonment bills that sits on mm -hmm. the, uh, and, and affects the, uh, yeah. the, the taxes coming out of the industry. So, uh, and I'm just not sure exactly how that happens in this model, and that's maybe the, my question. So continuity, uh, continuity is definitely a big part of that. Um, there's, a, uh, well, there's one project, uh, in, uh, for example, that uh, we've been working on for a very, very long time. And it is, uh, although it's contractually not that way, but it is in a very collaborative manner, uh, uh, where we are uh, working very closely with the rig company to, to do things differently. We're working very closely with the operator to do things differently. And there's been a tremendous learning curve. Uh, and we've gone from uh, an average of 30 days per well decommissioning to an average of seven days. You know, that's in a tremendous cost uh, advantage, right? So that's where we need to go, right? Let's mm -hmm. scale that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we, we have a, an allied question on this, uh, given that you know, it's, it's essentially new activity decommissioning, and it will ramp up around um, training of staff and different disciplines. And you know, I can say from a UK perspective, we're starting to see uh, geoscientists who specialize in decommissioning um, it's, it's uh, you know, very easy to say, well, it's just a, a task for the engineer, but actually the, the geoscientist needs to tell you what's in the hole before you can actually decide what to do with it. Um, so should the industry focus more on trying to build up these competencies um, and aid you know, training of these new disciplines to support these new business models? How, how should we do that? Yeah. Um, so this... The, the, the training is a very, very large part of it, right? Um, and there could be an external role in it, uh, and it could very well uh, be possible. But in the end of the day, um, the tasks that are being performed are very specific and trained by the individual uh, companies in the supply chain, how they are training their people, right? You, uh, it would be good to have a generic training for, for people to have the, the, the base. But very specific operations will still need to be taught by the companies that provide those services. And uh, the key is that there is a framework between those companies to train those other uh, uh, people uh, back and forth 
so that you know you can reduce the number of, of people. So training is a very big part, but there needs to be a formal way of agreeing on how to do that and who's going to take which risk as a result, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, pro it's probably something around um, sharing best practice as well, Nick. Right? So you know, so G scientists are working on you know what zones you have to abandon in the overburden. Actually, sharing those experiences across the different companies would be quite helpful. I'm not really aware of any dialogue taking place in that space at the moment, but. Um, you know, if you can reduce the number of zones you have to individually mm -hmm. isolate, then you can make a big difference to your decommissioning bill. So um, there's probably something we could do in that in, yeah. the, in that area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, it's, it needs some incentivization perhaps for the geoscientists because they would rather be doing the exploration and the production, and uh, the decommissioning seen as something that they. Uh, they don't want to get involved with, you know, that's, that's the death for the geoscientist in a sense. It's a big value lever for their companies, you know, if it's a 40 billion bill that's sitting there at the moment, yeah. eating into that makes a difference and if they're taxpayers in the UK, they kind of, uh, yeah. it's another incentive to do that as well. Yeah. I mean, I guess my point is it needs to be made into a sexy job somehow. <laughs> so um, so we, we also have a, a kind of allied question on uh, decommissioning of infrastructure related to um, carbon dioxide storage. Um, so there's obviously been some attempts at this and there are some active projects around the North Sea, but uh, w what else needs to be done to try and incentivize CCS or is this something that we, uh, we shouldn't be looking at? Yeah, well, I, I, have have symbol, I have a simple solution for that. <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the carbon costs, the emission costs needs to, uh, the, the needs to come up. Right. We we we've looked intensely at this for the for the for the DUC fields, <coughs> and uh, we could actually make. <coughs> uh, this is about four, five, six, seven years ago. We could make it a reasonable business case, if we assumed that the, the that the, the 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 cost of the CO2 quotas were about five times what they are today. Mm -hmm. So unless there is sort of a will to to go that way, it's not going to happen. I don't think so. And uh, I. I don't, and I don't think personally that the uh, that the economic environment is prepared to put that type of cost on, in, on on other industries to pay that type of money for emissions. So I think it's a, for, for us. It's for now at least, unless something really radical happens. It's a, it's a. It was an interesting. It was an interesting look, but I have uh, I have my really really severe doubts that we can pull that off. I hope we could. Yeah, I think Thanks. maybe just, just building uh, on that, I think, uh, if not all, uh, most of the oil companies he, uh, here have recognized climate change as, as a very serious issue, which we all have to play a role in. But as individual companies and even as collective, we are limited in what we actually can do here. So I think it's really a plea for us, for governments and the collective of that, to really make sure that the price is such that CCS becomes truly, truly viable. The technology is there. We have seen it in various trial projects. I find it very exciting as a way to help reduce uh, the, the, the CO2 impact which we have. But we need some help. As, as simple as that, and if that's maybe a message which you can take up what's towards the UK government, that would be fantastic. Great, good. Okay, so we're into the, the, the final few minutes here, so uh, I'd like to basically ask a question that I want all of you to answer, which is essentially, what would you say to someone young who's thinking of joining the industry today? What would, uh, what would encourage them in if they're thinking about doing something else? Uh, how, do you, how do you make the case for joining the oil and gas industry, particularly working in the North Sea? So, Trolls, would you like to start? I can go first. I would, um, I would first and foremost tell them that uh, the, the death of, uh, of the North Sea is, uh, is, is, is a really premature prediction. We have assets that we know will produce into the 2040s and that we want to keep alive a lot longer than that. So there's a great future. I'll secondly tell them that uh, we're gonna cha we are changing the way that we work, the way we behave, uh, and it's to to the tune of being much more accustomed to the way that young people like to work and share and be, so, uh, be social. And we are creating a whole new set of jobs over the next 10 years with the way we digitize our business, uh, the way we automate it, the way we, we uh, go about doing it. And that's going to be really sexy and they can be part of making that change. So come and work for us. Good. Dave? That's a real question. It's a real one for me. My daughter's just graduated in geology uh, <laughs> this summer, three weeks' time, we'll be attending our graduation. I mean, there's the, the big environment, which is energy demand continues to, to rise in response to 
you know, growing population and that population having a higher GDP per capita, so more energy intensive. So the longer term picture on, on requirement to continue to find oil and gas is, is real. Um, so there's, you know, this idea that, um, you know, there's not long term security in, in this industry is, is, I don't think is relevant. Locally in the North Sea, just now we continue to employ staff, we are bringing graduates, uh, we're bringing in um, assignments for, for younger staff from around the world to come to the North Sea because it's a fantastic learning place. The diversity of, of opportunity, whether it's looking at the different reservoirs you're looking at or different facilities you're working with, is, is quite unique in the globe. So it's, the North Sea creates is, is a fantastic uh, place, place to learn. You know, my coach and my daughter is uh, two things, in fact. One is, uh, you know, learn, you know, take the opportunity, but what you need to do is make sure your skills are current. And at the moment, are in skills being current? Is this digital agenda? She needs to develop mm -hmm. really good skills in that, in that space. And the second thing is, she needs to be mobile. And, and those two things are really important. When somebody wants a phrase, used a phrase which is, economic geography is key. And sure, the North Sea's got a life just now, but she needs to think about how she can play into the, the world beyond that. Yeah, okay. I did not manage to influence my son on his choice at uh, university <laughs> at all, so I'm not, uh, I'm not <laughs> uh, maybe ready to tell what uh, or how to attract the young people. But anyway, it's, uh, uh, I believe now that we have uh, got uh, huge interest from uh, graduates and we are now employing uh, young people. And I think that's really positive also for, for, for the rest of the organization because it creates uh, new ideas and new ways of, of thinking, uh, just getting those young people into the organization. And they are much more digital in their head than at least I am, so it's, it's, it's great also from that, uh, that side. And uh, if you look at our industry, I think really what is needed is, is we are talking about radical changes here. And if it is any industry at all which has so much data available, where you really can play with digitalization and analytics and, and machine learning and whatever. I think nobody can compete with us. What you see in some, uh, when, when, when uh, you see young people today, now they want to work in Google or Apple or whatever because they, it's much more fancy. But I think we also have a job to do really to, to, to show them what they really can learn and work with within the oil industry. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to tell them three things, right? Uh, one is the people that have just recently started in our industry and, and uh, or in the last four years, they have only known the downturn, okay? Uh, and it's not always like that. And that's what I try to tell a lot of them. Um, you know, things will change, it will turn around, and we will do th uh, business different. Um, but what I then always tell them is if you look at the demographics, and that's the second thing that I'd want to tell them, is the de demographics really look into, uh, look, uh, they're in their favor, right? I mean, we have just had uh, a major, we went from having a major concern of the biggest crew change to, uh, to releasing a lot of people, right? So there's a very large population of expertise that has retired, right? So when things start picking up and we start doing different, we're going to have a tremendous shortage of talent. So the opportunity is for them, right? Um, and the third thing that I w would want to uh, tell them that uh, um, if you look at uh, international energy growth and even if you look at, at uh, comparing that to uh, the, the growth of renewable ener energy, right, there is still, uh, you know, uh, another 30, 50 years of growth in this industry, right? That is beyond their career span. So, you know, I do not see where the concern comes from. That's all I wanted to tell them. Isabel? Thank you. So um, the, the energy demand is there and will be there. Uh, there will be a need for oil and gas uh, in the decades to come. We are, uh, um, this is for sure. Uh, we need to transform. This is for sure as well. I think the COP21, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Max, I mean, the, the whole industry has, and, and the countries have, have started to a shift. And uh, in total, we have really committed to these uh, two degrees, and uh, we are in the energy mix. We are integrating this is our, in our long-term plan investments. Uh, I think the oil and gas industry will transform, and we need this younger generation to help us and accelerate this transformation. Uh, there are a lot of uh, very exciting jobs that we probably don't even know about. 
uh, for the short term, I think uh, robotization, unmanned platforms, unmanned technology, um, a lot of digitalization in many aspects uh, uh, will occur probably sooner than we expect. It's probably a matter of a few years. Uh, so there is a lot of short-term, very uh, tangible, uh, exciting jobs and, and the future to invent. So I would tell them come and be adaptable and agile and there's a lot to be done. Yes. Max, Great. final word? Yeah, actually, if I reflect on when I started, a bit more than 20 years as an explorer in the North Sea, there was somewhat similar kind of feeling. We've been there, we've seen it, we've done it. What else is there still to be found? And look what we've done in the meantime. So it is incredible how much this industry has the ability to reinvent itself time and time again with, with new technologies. But uh, indeed, the bigger kind of picture, as Isabel was touching uh, upon as well, first of all, we need more and cleaner energy. That, that's very clear. Um, new energies, uh, renewables, these kind of things, yes, they will come. And actually in there, they're important roles for geologists and geophysicists as well. We're just ha talking about CCS or geothermal, absolutely. But even in the more conventional oil and gas, uh, again, as was pointed out, we will have an enormous growth still in, in those, and there still will be a majority energy source to provide to, to the world in, in several decades uh, to come. So big term, absolutely there. Specific for the North Sea, the question was, do we actually see a next chapter in the North Sea? I think absolutely yes. I showed you the chart in the last 10 years, 8 billion barrels were still found here, and it's not flattening off, so a lot to be done. Um, we see that with technology coming in time and time, new seismic, new other bits and pieces, but also new ways of working. It was really encouraging to what we've heard here, the desire for more collaboration, which will require a shift in behaviors. Again, that's, that, that's exciting. So I think altogether, the, the oil industry, although maybe seen at times as a little bit conservative, I think there's a lot of innovation uh, ongoing, a lot of experimenting more than we have de done before. So I think it's a fantastic place, actually, to start as a young geoscientist and uh, enjoy yourself for your career. Great. Thank you. So uh, that's, that's all we have time for, unfortunately. So that's the, uh, the end of the panel session, but I'm sure the debates will continue. Thank you to all of you for your, uh, your questions, anonymous or otherwise. And uh, thank you very much to the panelists. And I'm sure we can uh, build on this for, uh, for Copenhagen next year. So thank you for coming.